episode four of Adult Music, your podcast for discussion of music for the mature mind. I'm your co-host Russ here with Mike, and it's this me. is actually a part two of something we started last time. And honestly, we can't wait for it to be over. Of uh, discussion, actually, yeah, of, it feels like a completely different thing than last week. Yes, uh, discussion of the. Grammy Award nominees in the jazz and classical categories. In the last episode, we reviewed the jazz nominees, and we're off to the classical races this week and uh, looking at the various categories here. Yeah. Boy, this was uh, a lot of homework, wasn't it, Mike? It was a lot of homework. And let me tell you, you were talking last week about adult beverages. Well, my liquor cabinet is empty now because this was really rough to get through. <laughs> Yes, it was <laughs> not, I, not just because there were so many recordings, but uh, I don't I don't really know where they came up with some of these uh, these nominations here in the classical Grammys. Let me let me say something a little about this. Um, when when I uh, when I listen to classical music, I'll, you know, I'll sort of go through you know new releases and decide what I like. But when it comes time for awards, and we talked about how we don't really like awards, who's to say this recording is the best? It usually isn't. It's usually just a, a jury that comes up with it. Right. But every year I'll look at the, um, say, the Gramophone Awards from Britain, and I usually like what they um, choose. You know, they're, they're generally very good. Now, they're a British magazine, and they'll tend to nominate more British recordings than you would have really anywhere else in the world. And, you know, that's their right. It's, you know, they want to promote sure. music from, from Great Britain. Um, and but in here in the uh, Grammys, which is an American award, they've really gone off the cliff in nominating American things. And the thing about this is, they do this, of course, with the jazz Grammys too. But classical music, it, it it's really centered in Europe. It's not really an America centered type of music, and yet we're kind, you know, and not Europe isn't really Europe is, is a lot of different countries, a lot of different cultures. So you get this wide range of music, and but American music kind of there's it's it's more limited what they're what they're going to do. Right. So ha having all of these American, um, you know, nominees, especially uh, American composers in almost every category, is <laughs> it was really a little little too much. I thought yeah, it was it was rough. It's an expansive. Mm category geographically as far as composers and performers so yeah although i'm happy to see american composers recognized because Absolutely. certainly the american public is not listening to them especially the performer categories and it's hard to say that it's very well balanced and uh you know i agree with you on the gramophone uh picks yeah. and selections i always look at their year-end review for things i may have missed right um, we'll be so, talking by the way about the gramophone awards in september and that'll be a lot more fun than this was and yeah. i think we'll take more time with it too i don't think we'll yes. try to do it all in one episode and so i've i've had several adult beverages and i have another one to prepare me for reading mm. through this list so I'm sorry i wish i had some empty, so you got to stock could, up could, um, couldn't get to the boozeteria before this program the boozeteria yeah it was closed <laughs> so with no delay then uh and i'll say that um i'm not quite matured to appreciate many of the choral and vocal classical works so i've left that um judgment to you for this week. i did all of um, those well not all of them there were some i couldn't get yeah, a hold I'm of a, but we'll a talk about fan that of too. classical vocal works uh so i will defer to your adult maturity uh, in this podcast, but our first category, uh, mm. which is listed as number 75 in the Grammy list is best orchestral performance. And we and love orchestras, don't we? We both like orchestral music yes. a lot. And so we've got uh, some nominations here. We have the Aspects of America, speaking of America, Pulitzer edition. Ooh, and, Pulitzer uh, edition. Uh, yes. Look out. And so we've got... Uh, this recording by the Oregon Symphony and uh, Carlos Kalmar. And mm. this is uh, a series, a continuation in the series of Aspects of America. And uh, they have three symphonic works that were all awarded for a Pulitzer Prize. Ah. And then we have um, an interesting album called Concurrence that is uh, a, a collection of pieces by Icelandic composers, which is quite interesting. And they're all very interesting. Yes. Yeah. And uh, then we have uh, the 
San Francisco Symphony, conducted by Michael Tilson Thomas, uh, performing the Copeland Symphony Three. And yeah, then we have a recording, which sadly isn't on CD, by the way, or or vinyl. Oh, really? No, it's, Is it's, it only? It's only it, yeah. Well, we'll get to this. Let's keep oh, okay. going. Okay. All right. Okay. Just to go through. I don't, wanna, I don't want to comment on it yet. Then we have uh, on gramophone the uh, Ives Complete Symphony. Cons yeah. Complete symphonies. Actually, um, I, I don't know if this is complete because as I was reading information on it, he also has yeah. a symphony called the New England Holidays Symphony, which is not yeah. on here. Um, well, these would be the complete numbered, numbered symphonies, symphonies, one through so, four. This There's is, also uh, a universe symphony that he didn't finish, but uh, yeah. that's a, that's another story entirely. And this is by the uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic with Gustavo Dudamel. Dudamel. Dudamel, yeah. Dudamel. Dude. That's what I got anyway from my uh, research there. Your research. And then we have yeah. uh, something that I, you recommended to me earlier, which is yeah, the... Yeah, we heard this uh, earlier in the year. The, uh, how do I pronounce this now? The Lutoslavsky. Lutoslavsky, I guess would be the best symphonies, way for Symphonies number Americans. two and three. And there's yeah. also uh, a previous recording, one and four, isn't it? Uh, the, that was uh, yeah, from about two years ago. Two and years then ago, they've right? completed the cycle. He, right. like Ives, Lutoslavsky... Also did is, four symphonies. And this is the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra. And so Conducted those are the... Hanu Lintu. Yes, those are the nominee, nominees for this category. So um, starting out with the first one, Aspects of America, we've got here, uh, let's see, Walter Piston's Symphony Number no. 7 the, from 1961. Okay. And we've got Morton Gould's uh, String Music. Uh, that's 1995. Wow, and we've that's got pretty recent. The, let's see, uh, the third one is by Howard Hansen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is 1944. This is the, uh, let's see, Symphony Number no. 4, Requiem. Okay. Right. Um, so I listened to this one. The piston is kind of interesting in contrasts. Um, I kind of enjoyed it. The first two movements I found uh, kind of dark and brooding, mm -hmm. and then the third movement becomes kind of more exuberant and kind of joyful in uh, in its uh, sort of uh, expressions. I liked that. Uh, I also liked uh, the Gould has some interesting timbres of different instruments, and the melodies are easy to follow, and I kind of enjoyed that. And mm -hmm. then... Uh, the Hans, I, I liked all of these. The Hansen, the uh, Presto movement has some really nice, fun brass, and then the the final Largo Pastoral is very sweeping, in sort of scope. And yeah, you know, so I thought um, as a sort of collection of uh, American works, uh, I don't know what criteria something wins the Pulitzer uh, Award well, for. You have to be an American kind of composer to win, I, I guess. It, I think. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. These works uh, for me, for sort of more contemporary type of things, 20th century music, uh, I was able to sustain my interest and find something unique and enjoyable about all of them. So, yeah. Yeah, I would say, I would say um, that, that, that that summary is going to say something that we're going to, that's the same conclusion we're going to reach about a lot of these work. I was interested to hear it. It sustained my interest, but it really didn't knock me out. You know, it, I mean, you know, it was good. I liked yeah, it. I didn't That's what receive I any like epiphanies from this. Um, yeah. So you know, it was just interesting. Uh, I I know of these composers, but I hadn't particularly remembered either any of these works before. So um, interesting collection. Um, I want to mention, as far by as, the way, as far as yeah, but, best performance. Uh, I don't know if I can. You know, say that well, we can't say that this one is because there's going to be another yeah. one that that I think. Well, th yeah. there are three that I think are a lot better, but this this one specifically, I think that we're going to go for. I want to mention, by the way, before we go to the next one, uh, Walter Piston. Um, I, you know, I was I was born in 1965, so growing up, um, I remembered Walter Piston as the uh, author of a uh, music theory book that everybody used in the U.S. And that was really all he was known for. So it's been nice to hear his works um, 
his symphonies, his orchestra works, uh, receive recordings over the course of my lifetime. And he was really uh, only known as a as a teacher when I was when I was very right. young. But now his um, his works have been recorded mostly in the Naxos label, and uh, we got to know them a little bit. And he's quite a good composer. It's it's a, it's a shame uh, that his uh, works had weren't really performed so much, so often in his lifetime. They seem to be getting a little bit of a foothold now. Well, that's good. So that was nice. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll do and the next one. The next recording is uh, yeah. Concurrence and yeah, the Iceland, uh, the Iceland Dan Symphony Orchestra. Conducted by, it looks like, Daniel Bjornesson. Bjornesson, right. Um, yeah, I'm guessing. Um, and so we have uh, three composers here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher these names because... Uh, well, we are, uh, we are running through the pronunciation obstacle course today. Boy. Right, so the first one, mm. uh, we have uh, Metacosmos by mm. Anna Let me get Thorvaldstetter. And oh, Thorvald's Dottir. I okay, yeah. She's yeah. pretty famous now actually. Yeah. She uh she scored a movie uh of, I think a year or two ago that really you know okay. got a lot of attention. And uh, she's she's pretty much Iceland's premier um composer at the moment. Okay. Uh, she's getting a lot of attention. It, it, I, I works very that mysterious. The, the Icelandic mm. composers are sort of up and coming and a lot of attention is yeah, uh, being generated by them. Then we have yeah. uh uh, Halkor Thomason, Piano Concerto Number Two. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the third piece is uh, Maria Hold Markon Sigfustotitir. It's Good. Oceans. Okay. And uh, nice title. Paul Ragnar Paulson's Quake is the fourth piece. So okay. I listen to all of these, and uh, they're very unique and different from anything else um i would reading trying to understand the approach to the composition for these modern icelandic uh, composers uh some things i read is that they're neither neo-romantic so they're not uh, going back to sort of you know previous approaches and structures and also not confined to uh, modernist systems so they're not following some sort of uh you know 12 tone or some other kind of uh approach in structure and so trying to comprehend these in comparison with other works um and what is icelandic identity in these compositions uh, a lot of people have written some interesting kind of things. So, you know, we, we, we've talked about this before, uh, you and I, like, um, why do Russian composers sort of sound different? You know, when you hear mm. something composed by Russians, is there a, a sort of national identity? Is it based on something? Is it linguistic, cultural, environmental? Um, yeah. I have theories about this. I, I'm willing to bet, well, it's cultural, but I think a lot of it has to do with language, the way people speak, because I think it, that if you get to a pre-language place, I think the, the landscape or the weather that you kind of uh, grow up around sort of uh, influences everything. Well, and I guess that's what I'm thinking. Kind of comes out of that, yeah. I'm thinking, that's I'm the wondering. Way, that's what music says to me anyway. I'm wondering if it's more environmental landscape kind of things so like you know well you and i li both enjoy um you know scandinavian uh s symphonic works and things so we, yeah. we like nielsen so when you listen to you nielsen. Know, nielsen or you listen to sibelius is that music descriptive of the landscape and that's what i found you know not only i but other people have reviewed this music uh and it shouldn't be limited to that type of uh landscape landscape description but uh, these works they do when you listen to them they do sort of uh, elicit feelings of experience sort of like uh, this um, metacosmos when I listened to this I, I sort of felt like being on a lake when the uh, ice cracks or something mm -hmm. in this sort of low sonic wave that comes through um, and I couldn't really identify traditional elements of melody and things to follow but just by the different sound characteristics and 
the uh, combining of different tonal things in this music. I, I found it interesting. Um, I couldn't follow them along so well as sort of the composition trajectories, but they seem to evoke images of, you know, natural terrains or something that would occur in nature as I listened to them. And uh, so I thought that was kind of unique about them. And it did hold my interest as to what was coming next and the uniqueness of the sort of tones and use of instruments. So I, when I got to the end, I sort of felt that, oh, there may be an Icelandic unique sort of, uh, how can I say, uh, composition mm -hmm. style or approach to uh, this type of music. Uh, and Quake is another one at the end that features the uh, cello in it. And so this was uh, something unusual to me, but yet quite interesting. So anyone who likes contemporary, you know, classical compositions, I think they're, they're quite sparse, but then the elements that are introduced, you can identify and have enough space to think about the sounds that you're hearing. And uh, yeah. so I found them, I work sort of environmentally descriptive and yeah, uh, sort of like the landscape I would listen itself, to it again. Yeah, I want to mention like a lot of composers. I mean, we think I tend to think of uh, you know Nordic composers in general as being very uh, tied to the the landscape. You know, it seems like they're kind of evoking that all the time. I think of composers like uh, Erik Ventur in um, Estonia, mm -hmm. who, who he seems to do that quite a bit, especially in his earlier works. Um, but another composer that does it is uh, Beethoven. If we think about the uh, Pastoral Symphony, right. he's uh, describing a series of uh, events that I guess would be very common. I guess they're common to all of us because, they're, they're, you know, but because uh, I think the, the weather in Germany is similar to weather at that latitude all over the world. Um, but, uh, he, you know, he's a, he's a good example of that too, um, in that work at least. And he's done quite a few, uh, Beethoven did a few nature pieces. There's a piano sonata right. and a violin sonata that, that deal with um, yeah. natural themes as well. So uh, this All right, is definitely worth landscapes. This is definitely worth checking out, uh, especially yeah, if you okay. haven't heard these Icelandic composers. Um, I don't know if it's got a shot at winning, but if it gets them some recognition, um, then yeah, I think I'm all for it. Yeah. Speaking it's, of landscapes, Copeland Symphony Number no. Three is the next uh, um, choice. Now, when we think about American music from the early 20th century to about the 1960s. Uh, there were two sort of approaches, and one of them was the Copeland approach, which uh, there, he was trying to um, come up with an American music, and he looked to the landscape, the um, you know the the rugged West and things like that, these big wide open spaces that America has, especially in the Midwest and as you go further west, and uh, he's got this really big boned sound that he tried to apply to um, you know the American experience the American people and uh, that's very uh, um, how do you say current you know very obvious in this symphony I think it's, yeah because this is um, 1946 so it's yeah exact it's directly post-war so mm -hmm. sort of America on the victory of World War II um, and I really enjoyed this recording this stands out I've heard this, yeah, this work a number of times um, but I really enjoyed the way the performance was sort of, I don't want to say crafted, but uh, the, the, the way it was put together because this yeah, performance together, yes. is based on the fanfare for the common man that everyone knows. Um, right. And oftentimes when I've heard this before, you know, that is sort of blasted out. Um, right. When it, it, I, I believe the first movement introduces themes from that, but when it comes in at the end and then it sort of, you know, hammers you. But this is a really... Um, measured approach and it's a very careful and detailed performance the the recording is well balanced and then when the fanfare comes in it's very re it's rendered really subtly in the fourth movement so it doesn't stand out above the rest of the performance it, it's sort of just placed exactly for the continuity of the rest of the movements and yeah this is the best performance of this symphony that i've heard and, Me too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or oh, it just from start to finish, uh, all of the you know, sort of 
musical narrative is really well thought out and the balance and it comes to the end and uh yeah it's, it's a great performance uh, so i, I thoroughly great, enjoyed this one it's a great performance it's also a fantastic recording it, it the dynamics oh, are yeah. really uh vivid yeah. uh very clear you could hear detail i'm just, i'm thinking about at the end of the fourth yep. movement there was this this sort of harp figuration that was only accompaniment but it was so clear yeah. coming and out of the text no harshness at really all beautiful it, it, no it's, harshness uh, yeah, it's great um Oh, yeah, I, I like this a lot. Um, the recording before this, um, the, the famous one before this, and the one that was considered to be definitive was the Bernstein one that uh, Copeland was present for. Copeland was still alive at the time. So it must have been like 1988, 89, towards the end of uh, Copeland's life. And um, that 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 particular performance is guilty of um, having the blaring fanfare for the Carmen right. Man, you know, come out in the Fourth Symphony, Bernstein being overly dramatic. In in his his approach, I know there are a lot of Bernstein fans out there, and I like him too. But he really uh, he he really makes sure that you know that uh, it's Bernstein conducting when when he yeah. conducts a work. Well, he's, what he's I liked about really this one is that that, that mm -hmm. wasn't emphasized at all. It was just placed in the context of the the whole symphony here, and so um, right, yeah, it was it was uh, really good. Yeah, this is a fantastic performance, fantastic recording, and it needs to be preserved on a physical medium. This is only available as a download, an MP3. Yeah, that's too bad. And that is too bad. They're going to have to put this out on CD. So if anybody from the Academy or from uh, the San Francisco Symphony is listening, uh, get to work on that. Mike put this will on buy CD. it. I'll buy I, it. I tell you, Mike will buy it because he buys everything. I will buy it. I buy, buy everything. It. It's true. true. It's true. All right, yeah, so that one's a great one. We both like that. Uh, next yeah. up, we've got the Ives Complete Symphonies, Numbered Symphonies, anyways, on the gramophone label. And mm -hmm. um, this one, uh, yeah, I liked it. Uh, the recording is nice, especially the string sound is very lush and uh, warm. Um, yeah. Ives, I'm not a total fan of Ives. Um, you can see his development when you listen to these uh symphonies yeah. in order they i believe get the more first complex as they the go the first symphony i believe was written when he was still a student and yeah. um it's very much um you know in a tradition uh the melodies are are nice and it's yeah, it good sounds like brahms basically yeah. the first time. when you by the time yeah. you get to three and four though you're sort of you're getting out on on a limb uh with uh sort of tonalities and uh the complex harmonies uh, and but i don't feel that for me anyway that the the sort of journey is always worth the, the sort of uh, things that i have to listen to try to understand so i'm not I'm, I'm not totally a fan of the other two symphonies but as far as the recording goes uh and the performance it's uh yeah, it's enjoyable and it's nice to have all four together here um not outstanding for me but uh i did like to when I listen to them, I, I have these recordings broken up so, over some different CDs, so I've never yeah. you know, gone one to four in the order. So that was sort of uh, eye-opening for me. I think uh, this recording comes at a good time. Ives, um, he, he's rather famously uh, wanted to um, express the American experience as opposed to like Copeland, who want, who's more of the American. He wants to create like a sort of uh, American, like sort of myth sort of or you know, the, the American persona or something. I, I've, um, as, as he, he incorporates a lot of, um, popular tunes in his, uh, symphonies and in really all of his works, um, as they go on. And the fourth symphony is, he, he's thinking more of the, uh, transcendentalist, I think the Ralph Waldo Emerson, that, that type of thing. And he understands, if you remember, there was a, something that, uh, president, uh, Barack Obama once said that he, democracy is messy he said. And Ives completely understands that because his symphonies have a kind of messiness to them. There are a lot of like contrasting rhythms and different melodies going on at the same time and not fitting together. And I think he sees that as the American experience. So instead of deciding, you know, oh, which melody is better, we should kind of hear the whole thing as this one complete, big, messy, glorious whole. I uh, <laughs> I liked these. I liked this. Um, yeah, I, I think it has something to teach us today, too. So I think every, all Americans should listen to this recording and uh and and like it <laughs> it's it's not easy music really well it's the first the first symphony is very easy but it gets the fourth symphony is yeah, they, a bit of a they challenge take you on a journey yeah you can they see do. His, yeah you can see how he developed uh over the course of these symphonies hmm. and the last one uh 
Rostowski. Yeah, this is a gorgeous recording. Uh, also, if you collect, um, you know, physical media, this is on SACD, so it's like DSD Ooh. processing. Yes, it's I have two really players myself. Velvety so and nice, yeah. Give me DSD. Yeah. Feed my head with DSD. We both like DSD a lot. Yes, we do. So we wish everything came out on SACD and was sort of recorded for that. Yeah, you're a medium in mind. You're a bigger fan of uh, this composer than I. Um, I, uh, yeah. I I like it a bit. Uh, I get lost in the weeds uh, on the recording. The third symphony is first. Uh, it's quite mysterious, but what I liked is through the sort of journey of you know all all sorts of different sounds. He sort of uh, brings you back with this recurring uh, riff of percussion and brass. Right. Ta -ta 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 -ta. And then, yeah. um, yeah, it's and so that like sort a, of, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, it's sort of like nailing the sheetrock in, and then like, I thought of it as more as like, a, looking at somebody's slides and that, 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 that is kind of like the, the space between the slides when be. one slide comes out and the next one goes in to yeah. the projector. It's kind of an interesting, uh, technique, but that, uh, sort of keeps it, keeps me sort of on the page and then, uh, and then I'm ready for more experimentation. Uh, yeah, and then the in the second... He, the second okay, let me just say, say yeah, this really fast. The, the, reason, the reason he did that is because he's using what's called a, an aleatoric techniques where he'll like write out these parts for the various uh, musicians, but he won't tell them when to play them. They can play them basically when they want. So every uh, performance of this work is going to sound different. Now, right. the, the cost of that is that the music doesn't move. It's very static. And to keep it moving along, he's got that, 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 that thing to move it onto the next section. Yeah, speaking yeah, of the aleatoric, that's what I mm -hmm. um, read about the uh, second symphony, um, especially mm -hmm. in the uh, second movement. It's a uh, there's this sort of sound they call a sound mass that's yeah. based on these aleatoric gestures, and um, <laughs> as one uh, thing I read described it as a sustained searing scream. Um, and so, <laughs> read that. um, yeah, it's in the first movement of the, the second oh, one. So the, not to listen again. Yeah. There, there is in that, in that movement, it, this sort of, you know, sound it, it, it's, as you say, the, the way that, uh, it's, um, sort of left up to the players and then it, it comes out as this sort of breathing wall of sound. Um, yeah. Um, it, it's, these are interesting to me. I, I don't really enjoy them all that much, and I liked three more than I liked uh, two. So right. um, I thought yeah. I liked three better as well. Uh, one thing about Ludoslavsky's music too, it, it, his orchestral music at least, is um, when, when you're not using like straightforward melody, you have to come up with something else to keep the uh, listener engaged. And uh, in his case, it's timbre. The uh, the actual sound of the instruments. The timbre is like, say, what makes the violin sound like a violin. You know, you know it's a violin because it makes a violin sound. The violin sound is the timbre of the instrument. So just combining all these different timbres makes it really intriguing. I really liked it a lot. I, I like that kind of music too. Debussy really started that um, in his orchestral works. And uh, I like that approach a lot. We're going to get to another composer who uses that approach as well a little later. Yeah, so okay. those are the uh, nominees for the best orchestral. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think for me, the most enjoyable recording was the Copeland, just because I have things to compare it to. Um, yeah. I have the other recordings of the Ives, but this one didn't stand out um, to me as you know any, anything greater than those. It was just nice hearing all of the symphonies on, uh, together. Uh, I feel like was, I need more time with the Ives, really. Yeah. It's, uh, they're, they're difficult works. They're not, you know, you can't really absorb them in one listening. Ludoslavsky is uh, new and interesting, and the most out there sort of new experience for me was the uh, concurrence. So as to what they'll pick, I have no idea. Um, I'm going to pick Copeland. Copeland, yeah. I, I think, think that would be the be safe pick. Um, I yeah. think that's the best performance it's, it's a great and performance as well. It's great. So. And I'm just happy the concurrence got in there and listed. And so, you know, maybe people will give it more recognition. And um, By the but, way, I'm uh, looking up the uh, concurrence um, on CD, and it comes on a CD plus Blu-ray audio. 
And well, I don't know how. Video what, I don't know what the processing um, for Blu-ray audio is, um, but it certainly has a higher sampling rate than anything else out there. I don't know that this recording was made for that, but um, that would that would be awesome Fire to hear. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we 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 you and I both like DSD a lot. We find yes. like it's really smooth and velvety. We kind of like the the way that sound comes out. I don't know how Blu-ray audio is processed though. Um, I don't know. I don't have a Blu-ray videos player, so yeah. yeah. I, so anyway, I'm, that's the I'm in the market for one now. The orchestra. So I I guess we will both say that uh, the Copeland is would be our pick on this one. Yeah, I, I, instantly Blu-ray audio is uh, the same as Blu-ray video. It's not like DVD and video and DVD audio where you needed two completely different players to play them. Right. Um, th these are both the same. Blu-ray audio would play on your Blu-ray video machine. Right. Okay. All right, moving on, I guess. All right, now it's into Mike's realm. Into oh, this is my realm. The world, now. the best opera recording. Yeah, one one little caveat about that. I I do like vocal music, but uh, like Russ, I prefer instrumental music, and a lot of my picks for the show are going to be of you know chamber works and uh, orchestral works with no vocals in them. Um, I, but here's here's the thing. I used to write for uh, a, a a local magazine called Kansai Time Out, which and I wrote about uh, classical concerts that were coming up, and uh, I would get letters from uh, readers. Um, saying you need to do more vocal performances. So I learned by that that most people who listen to classical music listen to vocal music. And this really isn't surprising. I'm people sorry like to hear, to hear human voices, right? When I we guess. like pop music, right? We're listening to the singer. We're not really necessarily listening to the, uh, you know, the bass line, although I am. I am. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I we're am. weird. I'm always listening to the bass line. Yeah. Now, when we talk about adult music, we're talking about more abstract sort of we you know we like the more abstract sort of music and we hope a lot of you we hope to turn a lot of you on to it um but yeah cl in classical music vocal music and especially opera are the the most uh, popular genres um i'm i do like vocal recitals and we'll do a few of those on on our uh, podcast but uh you know if we're going to do an opera i'm going to have to get Russ to listen to an opera so that, that's well, I can do one, of, but in general, yeah, I'm tired of listening to people talk, including yeah. myself. So, All right. Um, All right, let's go through this. Um, best opera recording. Number one, we have Norman Dello Gioio, an Italian-American, incidentally, like myself. Okay. His opera, The Trial at Rouen. Okay, now this um, opera, uh, uh, let me just name them all first, and then we'll go through the list. Number two is Carlisle Floyd, a contemporary composer. Inside, Norman Dello Gioio is a, um, was a 20th century composer, and um, he died in 2008. So, you know, he's not, not, he's not from that long ago. Uh, Carlisle Floyd is a contemporary composer. His opera, Prince of Players, is uh, the second choice. Number three, our good friend George Gershwin's only opera, Porgy and Bess, and what a shame because that is uh, quite a work. Um, he he died shortly after this, uh, of I think of cancer when he was uh, thirty nine years old. Boy, you know, if only he had lived another forty years, what music we would have. Uh, George Friedrich Handel, Baroque era composer, Agrippina. Okay, I'll talk about that in a moment. And the last one is uh, Zemlinsky, uh, his opera Der Zwerg. Zemlinsky is a, a contemporary of Gustav Mahler, so end of the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, what they would call fin de siècle. Although I'm not sure we can use that term anymore because we're in a new century now. All right, anyway, Norman Dello Gioio, The Trial at Rouen. Rouen is, of course, <laughs> of course, I had to look this up too. This is where... Um, uh, Joan of Arc's trial was held, and the op the opera is about the trial of Joan of Arc. Now, it turns out that Dello Gioio composed uh, an early version of this opera called The Trial of St. Joan. And uh, it was performed, and then he, um, I, I guess he withdrew it, but he, he wrote a symphonic work based on its themes, and that uh, starts off this recording. So it's the first... Uh, three tracks on this are a um are, are a symphony and this was quite a surprise though joyo's writing is really lush and, and i think it's a bit like the howard hansen that you talked about earlier you know it's it's this lush mm. composition it's really beautifully judged um pacing is nice it's all 
it's all very well realized and it's i i would say it's it's not thrilling music but it's very good and it is engaging okay i liked it. i liked this work a lot i was really surprised at the skill that he had in um his um orchestration and putting his ideas across okay now after that we heard the we hear the opera the trial at Rouen. okay this was um premiered in 1955 on tv it was on i guess nbc it was like a tv opera uh, the new medium at the time. I don't think many people had TVs in their houses in 1955. Opera on TV. What an idea. Yeah. Uh, there are a few of those. There's a uh, Giancarlo Menotti's, um, Christmas opera. Um, do you, I, yeah, I can't remember what it's called at the moment. Um, let me see. Uh, okay. Anyway, let's get back to this. Okay. So yeah, this was a bit of a find. Now earlier I had mentioned that, um, Copeland's, um, was looking for an American sound. Uh, in the early 20th century, up until around the 1960s, the um, the opposing uh, camp to people like Copeland and Ives would have been people like Samuel Barber, who were writing in a more European style, influenced by Brahms in the late 19th century and trying to continue that. So while the wars went on and then Europe went into this um, dodecaphonic, 12-tone, um, you know, uh, avant-garde, Music. America was still trying to, you know, write music like Brahms, or trying to come up with a an American style. The uh, the serial, there there were serial composers in America too, but I think they came a little later when Schoenberg finally came to America and uh, introduced it in the uh, in the war years. Okay, so um, this one Della Joya is more in the barber camp. He he composes like a European, and. This is in opera. This is kind of an odd thing um, because there, the music is coming first. The language isn't coming first, so I feel like the language doesn't fit comfortably into the uh, the melodies that these composers are writing. The English language uh, words that they're using. I feel like, um, especially in America, uh, English fits more with pop music. Pop music has figured this out. Okay. Um, think about the, um, the great American songbook songs, or you know, any any uh, American pop songs from the fifties, sixties, or you know, afterwards. Um, they they fit very comfortably. And uh, Dvorak, I think, when he came to America in the late nineteenth century, um, advised people to look to your popular music and to you know create your art music out of that. I think he was absolutely right, and that, that is the uh, type of American music I like. So, in this case, Della Gioia's opera, I felt like the uh, the um, libretto, the sung text, doesn't really sit comfortably with the music. This is actually the case with a lot of American operas, um, including Philip Glass's, like, more recent operas. I think he wants, he's he does that intentionally, though. That's another story, though. Okay, so I never heard this opera before, and uh, it was a surprise. I rather liked it. I thought it was well composed. Okay, it's easy on the ear, harmonically straightforward. I mean, you can follow the music easily. It's, um, I wouldn't say memorable, but it's not off-putting in any way. Um, all right, uh, harmonically straightforward. Um, this would have been enough to dismiss it in Europe at the time, so it never gained a foothold there. Um Okay, and it's an opera. If you've never heard it and you like opera, this is a, actually probably a good one to investigate. It's ripe for rediscovery. Okay, it's an American opera with a European theme, I think, which also sort of doomed it, you know. Um, I think American operas, you want to make them about American themes, don't you? Okay, so uh, he's definitely you know, on uh, the the Copeland side. I mean, not the Copeland side, the Barber side here. Okay, the, the singer's Heather Buck sings. She's got a big voice, high ringing notes, very good. Uh, she actually sounds rather girlish in the role, which is appropriate for St. Joan, who was, uh, I think, a teenager when she was burned at the stake. Okay, and she's got this defiance, this, this good kind of dramatic defiance in the opera. I liked it a lot. The melodies in this opera aren't terribly memorable. I was attracted by the pacing and orchestration. So I would say uh, this is worth a listen. It's good. And that's all I'm going to say about it, really. Okay. Next, Carlisle Floyd, contemporary composer, The Prince of Players. This uh, opera pre premiered in 2016, I believe. Uh, I didn't write that down. I'm just kind of <laughs> trying to remember it. Um, all right. This is, um, let's see, Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra and the Florentine Opera Chorus. 
uh, conducted by William Boggs. And the soloists are Alexander Dobson, Keith Fairs, and Kate Royal. Okay, this opera sounds more like a theater piece than an opera. And I had to hear this. Now, I, I should also mention uh, the Della Gioio I heard on um, streaming, and the libretto was surprisingly available online so i got to follow the text so i knew what was happening in this case uh the floyd i didn't prince of players i really didn't know what was happening uh in this i, I read a synopsis and it's apparently about a uh it, it takes place in 17th century england and it's about a um cross-dressing uh actor and uh i think there are all sorts of sexual shenanigans going on in the opera so i think it's a bit uh um Oh, shall we say, uh, titillating adult, to the audience. Ad adult music-ish. I guess, yeah. All right, in fact, a lot of, uh, I was reading some of the reviews, and a lot of the um, reviewers were going off on how, oh, sexual ambiguity, but to be honest, this is nothing new in opera. It's gone back to the, uh, you know, this goes back to the Baroque era with the castrati in Italy. We'll get more, we'll get to that later, too, because it turns out that there's a, a recording in this uh list that's that deals with that as well um we'll get to that um okay so uh this takes place in the english theatrical world a lot of sexual ambiguity and you know i think it's a live performance i'm not sure because i thought i heard the audience laughing it might have been the uh people on stage though acting um it sounded enjoyable to me but i think this recording really requires a a uh visual in order to enjoy you need to see what's happening on the stage musically it's really not interesting i just i i wasn't interested in what i was hearing at all um but it might have been a really interesting um theater performance i would have liked to have seen it i would go to see this if it was showing the recording though i don't know unless you, you unless you're going to follow with a libretto which is the proper way to do it um i, I just didn't you know it didn't engage me musically let's just say that okay speaking of American popular music. Now, first of all, I need to confess, um, Gershwin, Porgy and Bess, this is by the um, Metropolitan Opera in New York, and it's available on a CD, but not available streaming. I do not own the CD, and I could not stream this, so I didn't hear this performance. So I can't tell you what I thought of it, unfortunately. Um, Gershwin is a perfect example of how um, American popular music can translate well into classical music, because Porgy and Bess is basically an opera. I've heard the opera many times on different recordings and even live once. Um, it's a good example of how popular song can be made to fit into the, um, you, you know, the operatic, um, you know, you know, in, you know in, in the operatic style, the theater and all of this singing. The, the words fall well in a popular song. It has to, otherwise people won't listen to it. Um, the 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 big problem with Porgy and Bess as an opera is the the big structure. Gershwin tries to like fit the music together with these sort of motifs, sort of like Wagner did, but he didn't really understand the whole technique, and nor would he have used it the way Wagner would have anyway, had he lived longer and continued to uh, do this sort of thing. So the opera doesn't really hold together structurally, musically, but it doesn't matter because the tunes are so great. Um, so many jazz um, um, singers have taken up uh, a lot of these songs or a lot of these um, arias, shall we say, since it's an opera, um, that it doesn't matter. Okay, let me just say the uh, the conductor is David Robertson and the vocalists here are Frederick Ballantyne. I'm guessing he's um, Porgy. Angel Blue. Uh, Denise Graves, Latonia Moore, and Eric Owens. Okay. I'm um, sorry I can't really report on this recording. I'm sure it's good, um, but I didn't hear it. All right, next one. This was uh, a recording, Handel Agrippina, Baroque Era Opera, conducted by Maxime Emelianchev. Emelian, Emelianichev. I don't know how to say his name. Okay. The soloists are Elsa Benoit. And the title character is Joyce Di Donato, and she really is the star of this set. She really makes this happen. Uh, Franco Fagioli, also. Jakub Josef Orlinski and Luca Pisaroni. Uh, Daniel Zelle is the producer. Okay, and the, um, the ensemble playing this is an Italian outfit called Il Pomo d'Oro. Okay, it's a little uh, Italian pun there in the name. 
Okay, pomo is a kind of um, it's a kind of apple, and doro would mean gold, so like a golden apple. But if you put it together, pomodoro means a tomato, so it's like a little uh, little pun on the name of the group there. All right, now this op the opera. First of all, it's a baroque opera. It's different. Baroque opera is a lot different in its pacing than like a modern opera, which is more like you're going to see the story. In a Baroque opera, you're really listening for the arias and the emotions um, invoked in the arias. Um, the um, the action in a Baroque opera happens in the, the recitative, the recitativo. Um, you know, the, the story will hurry along. It's almost like a theater piece. And then the entire story will stop and the singer will sing an aria about how he or she feels and usually it'll be a contrasting emotion there'll be two parts but that's what people in the baroque era wanted to hear so we need to kind of adjust our expectations if we're listening to a baroque opera okay the the story Ag agrippina is um uh the um roman emperor claudius's wife and uh the story is about her machinations to get her son Nero on the Roman th throne. Um, and since we all know our Roman history, we know that she succeeded, but not quite in the way that we think in this opera. Okay. Okay. In order to do this, of course, be this being ancient Rome, there's all sorts of duplicity and passion involved. Also, it's opera. So uh, it wouldn't be an opera if there wasn't duplicity and passion. I remember the uh, Boston Opera used to have a cool T-shirt that said, um, "It said like murder, you know, you know, rape, theft, you know, all to your favorite tunes." That's really what uh, opera is. <laughs> all right, so all of that's in this. Um, all of those things happen in this uh, opera too. Uh, what makes this recording great is Joyce Di Donato. She, she's um, She's an American uh, soprano, and she has like a she's like a real uh, spitfire. She's got a lot of uh, energy, lots of passion. There's this big ringing voice, wide range of emotion, and uh, she gets to use most of her uh, emotion her, of her range in expressing this conniving character's machinations. Okay, there are subplots for the other singers. They're all excellent. They all get a uh, a chance to really shine. But Di Donato really stands out in this opera, and she carries it. Uh, she has presence and authority, and uh, this opera is my pick as the winner because of her. Okay, this really is an outstanding performance, and uh, well worth hearing. Okay, now, by the way, you might think of uh, dramatic opera, and this is sort of a dramatic opera. It is a dramatic opera. You think of them as having, like, these sad endings with everybody dying, right? But that doesn't happen in Baroque opera. Baroque operas were often uh, performed in front of kings or emperors or whoever, some kind of royalty. And uh, the, th the idea was that the royalty in the opera sort of represented the royalty who was watching it. So they couldn't really be insulted or killed or anything like that. Anyway, at the end, uh, Claudius winds up uh, putting everything to rights and uh, he winds up accepting Nero as his uh, successor and everybody is happy including our conniving character, Agrippina. All right, last is Zemlinski, Der Zwerg, means the dwarf. Um, I didn't get to hear, I've heard this opera before, but I didn't get to hear this recording either. It was not available on streaming, and I don't own a copy of it. And uh, I think this, I've heard this before. It's okay. It's a nice piece from its uh, era. Um, it's about, a oh, I don't I read about this I don't remember now the, it's about a dwarf uh, who um, I think he falls in love with this princess and um, she rejects him basically and it's supposed to um, it's said to uh, echo uh, Zemlinsky's uh, love of Alma Mahler who eventually wound up marrying Gustav Mahler you know her, you know she wasn't she was um, <laughs> Mahler wasn't her maiden name. All right, and uh, so I can't really say much about this one. But anyway, there you go. That's um, that's the opera category. I'm picking Agrippina to win this group and because of Joyce Di Donato. Okay. Next, we have Best Choral Performance. Uh, Russ, you want to say something before I get to this? or Because uh, we're, we're just going to go down the feeling, list here. I'm feeling really sad for all the dwarfs. Um, oh. You know. Um, what, why is that? 
I don't know. I guess nobody marries them anymore. But yeah, well, he gets kind of he gets screwed in this uh, opera in the end. I think mm-hmm. it's a sad ending for. Yeah, in very... this category, I I really wanted to hear the Gershwin. I think there are, there are some uh, videos available online of the of the live performance of oh, this particular one. Yeah, oh, um, I didn't check YouTube. Unfortunately, okay. it seems that the um, the Metropolitan has their own record label. Yeah, well, good for them. From, but... And uh, well, rightly so. But as you say, mm. yeah, you can't you can't find this uh, without actually purchasing the uh, physical media. So uh, it's hard to review. Um, there and I don't know what the uh, Zimlinski what label this yeah. one is on, but um, yeah, uh, availability is interesting. It comes up again in another uh, category as we go through. So, uh, but anyway, even though uh, it's one of the older versions, you recommend the uh, Honda is uh, is a yeah. It's not it's not an old out. version. It's just an old opera. Yeah. Um, but, um, incidentally. Uh, this Verg, let me let me take a look. I'm just looking this up now. Uh, is available. Ah, no wonder why I couldn't hear it because it's only available as a Blu-ray or a DVD video. Oh, it's there's no CD of it, so you'd okay. have to actually watch well, this. Yeah, right. as as uh, someone who doesn't appreciate opera all that much, when when I can appreciate it, it's when I'm you know visually. Uh, watching it also, so I can understand. Uh, yeah, it, that, it is on the Naxos on... Uh, label, but only DVD or Blu-ray. Oh, okay. Mm. Okay. I mean, it's sort of like other genres of music. I think to like uh, flamenco music or something. I guess when you you know you take the dance portion out of it, uh, you're you're taking some part of the experience away, and especially in opera, the visual part of it and understanding the story is really integral to appreciating the whole work so um, I think that's probably the best way to uh, approach it especially for someone like me and I I can't really get into just the uh, recordings of them on for myself Uh, but if I watch something on video or see it live eh, it's much more enjoyable for me Hmm. but uh, so you uh, pick uh, that one for your Agrippina. Agrippina for the uh, performance of Joyce Di Donato, and I know she's a big favorite of the uh, right. Academy too. They really, she's she's a big favorite among Americans oh. these days. I think they'll, I, I think they'll, they'll go, go for that. And yeah. so, all right, in the next category, Floyd, then Carla Floyd could win because that that opera made a big splash. But uh, I don't, I musically, I didn't think it was so great, really. Mm. Okay, anyway, next we go to Best Choral Performance. My, uh, This is probably the weakest category in the uh, classical Grammys, I'm sorry to say. Anyway, the first, uh, let's go through the list. Uh, the first is James Primosh's, um work, Carthage, which is apparently part of a series. Uh, next, uh, Richard Daniel Poor, The Passion of Yeshua. Uh, next one, Kostalski, Alexander Kostalski, Requiem for Fallen Brothers. Okay. Uh, choral work by Ru- Russian composer, early 20th century. Uh, next is Paul Moravec's uh, Sanctuary Road. And the fifth one is a set of um, choral works called Once Upon a Time. Um, Matthew Guard Conductor and the Skylark Vocal Ensemble. Okay, and there's also a narrator, Sarah Walker, in that one. I'll, I'll get, to, I'll explain in a moment. First, Carthage by James Primosh. This is part of a series. Um, the, this is a performance by The Crossing. This is the name of the group is The Crossing. Donald Nally is the conductor. Okay, this is I. This is something where the text and this this drives me crazy when this happens. When the text is more interesting than the music that sets it. All right, you have this really interesting text, and then the music sort of lets it down. That's kind of what I feel like happened here. This is a philosophical work, and it incorpor- and it's very spiritual. It incorporates texts by Meister Eckhart, the uh, mystic, St. Thomas Didymus, Thomas Merton, who you may remember from the 20th century, oh, wow. and Wendell Berry, American um, essayist and novelist, too. Okay. Uh, the composing style often echoes Renaissance-era religious works. Very nice. Okay. But with many modern harmonies. Um it sounded like something that you would hear sung in a medieval church, except that it's a modern work with harmonies. I liked it. 
for its spiritual themes, and the singing is really excellent. The recording is fantastic. Great recording. I thought the uh, music, um, I don't know, it didn't really lift the text up to a new level. And I feel like that's what's got to happen in um, vocal music or uh, especially in choral music. Think about um, the Ode to Joy, right, um, in uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, we, we think about the Schiller poem, and it's really inspiring. But, boy, that Beethoven's setting of that is just uh, unforgettable. Okay, and it makes the poem unforgettable as well. All right. I don't know how unforget it's a it's a really good poem, but it's not as unforgettable as it is after Beethoven sets it to music. That's sort of a high bar to set, but um I don't really feel like I feel like the text he sets here are far more interesting than the music. Um the next one, Dan Richard Daniel Port, The Passion of Yeshua. Yeshua is Jesus. So this is like a um it's it's like a Middle Eastern name for Jesus. So this is a um passion um oratorio. Um, let me see. This is nominated in several categories, and I need to find what the other category is here. I think it's I... best contemporary composition. Contemporary, so I right. actually listened to this one myself too. Okay. Oh right, yeah. So pl feel free to comment on it then. Um, it's it was written in 2017. Um, the text is taking a Middle Eastern point of view, which makes the text interesting. And again, the text is more interesting than the music the idea is is good you know having a passion setting from um the middle eastern point of view without our sort of like sort of european or american like ideas of it the music didn't grab me at all and uh actually i'm really not a big fan of richard daniel poor's music to be honest it's very neatly composed like all of his works harmonies are clean nicely done but it really doesn't grab the emotions at all. It just kind of feels like a well-dressed, sort of well-put-together work that really doesn't engage the interest. Okay. Um, again, another very unfair comparison. When we're thinking of um, passions, passion oratorios, we think of Bach, right? The uh, right. Matthew Passion and the John Passion. And uh, those certainly elevate their texts way above, you know, well, I wouldn't say way above in their, for their biblical texts, but they really do kind of make them stick in the mind far more, okay, than they do if you just read them. Okay, the music idea is really nondescript. Um, it this this work sounds like it could have been. It was written in 2017, but it really has, you know, pre-serialism, early 20th century sort of, uh, you know, uh, feeling to it. It kind of sounds like Mendelssohn, really. Um, anyway, I didn't, I didn't like this. This didn't grab me at all. Do you it's want to say two something? Two CDs of a hundred minutes. Yeah. It's also, long. it's very long, and as, as you mentioned, I mean, you're you're going against comparison with traditional passions, right? And in that sense, con considering you know the, the religious content of it, then mm -hmm. you're expecting to be sort of transported to something significant by the musical content of it. And I didn't get that at all. Um, I found that, you know, the music was relatable and understandable. Uh, yeah. And for contemporary work, it's it's not sort of, um, how can I say, uh, standing out in terms of, you know, the harmonic right, constructions yeah. or anything. It's relatable and it's it's well constructed, but I didn't yeah. get any passion myself from it, and so you know, to make it to make it to the end, I just wondered if it, is it worth reworking the same passion theme in a modern context? I, I understand the context for sort of uh, I, apparently he wanted to take also sort of a Jewish approach to mm -hmm. it, and not only a, a Christian approach to the idea of the right. passion, but if it, if it doesn't bring that much more musically to it, uh, just having the different sort of uh, contextual perspective with it at that length, uh, I lost interest by before the end of the first CD, to be honest. I know, so, right? A um, hundred yeah, minutes long, it it's very long. Me. Yeah, it didn't hold me to Well, too. for a passion, too. I mean, I can't even listen to the uh, Bach passions all the way through without a pause. They're just too long. Yeah, they're very long. Uh, so you need a you need a little break, yeah. I think, in those. Um, yeah. I, Daniel Poor, I almost feel like his music is like, um, it's like a frame 
around a picture and the picture is really interesting and the frame wants you to pay attention to the picture but the frame itself isn't interesting you know i don't feel like music should be a frame i feel like it should really be something that's kind of um you know grabbing your attention you know or pushing the ideas out okay and that doesn't i don't feel like that happens here okay next one Kostel alexander kostalski russian composer 1856 to 1926 so he's really in the uh uh, the modernist era, the pre-Soviet era, that's very important, okay, because um, once the Soviet Union came along, Russian music really stopped. Um, it, it was kind of cut off from musical developments in the West, which is where all the action was happening. But um, this is very much in the uh, romantic or you know, the modernist um, tradition. This is Requiem for Fallen Brothers is the full name of the work, um, and it's um, written for um, the, his fallen Russian countrymen in World War One. Okay. Um, Kostalski had a recording of memory, a piece called Memory Eternal. I guess that was also um, a memorial for World War One a few years back, and that made a bit of a splash. So I was interested to hear this one. Um, it's moving. I liked this. It's It's got like kind of a Russian sound. We talked about, um, but it's not a Russian group playing. It's actually an American group, um, the uh, St. Luke's um, Leonard Slatkin conducting. And... Uh, uh, let's see who's on this. Um, Charles Br Charles Bruffy, Stephen Fox, and Benedict Sheehan. Well, you know, were the chorus masters. Okay. Joseph Charles Butel and Anna Dennis, the Orchestra of St. Luke's, Cathedral Choral Society, the Clarion Choir, Kansas City Chorale, and the St. Tikon Choir, taking on a Russian work. Okay, the Russian uh, element of it does come through in the composition. There's, there's a funny um, sort of... There's, there's a specific way that Russians sort of space the voices or really weight the low end. Um, they really love basses. They like those, those really low voices a lot. You don't really hear any of that really big Russian bass going on in this. But they, they like to accent to it, um, sort of accent the lower end of the, uh, the uh, frequency spectrum. Yeah, I guess you could say. Okay, this was a... It was mildly moving. I think the work could have been more moving if it were... Uh, if I had heard it from a, a more idiomatic performance of it from a Russian orchestra, but it's just good to have it recorded. Um, shimmering orchestration played by very large forces, as you heard. I just you know named all these, rattled all these names off. This was one I liked it enough. Um, it's a good setting. Um, this is going to be my pick of the choral um, recordings for the Grammy. Um, I didn't think it was outstanding, but I think it was the best of this lot. Okay, next is Paul Moravec, Sanctuary Road. This is a, um, okay, Paul Moravec is a contemporary composer, and he was born in 1957 in Buffalo, New York. This Sanctuary Road was written in 2017. It's very recent. Um, and it's based on William Still's book, The Underground Railroad, published in 1872. William Still was, um, is often called the father of the Underground Railroad, the system that um, brought slaves from the South to freedom in the North. And in his book, he sort of explains all the uh, the intricacies of that operation. Uh, Moravec is setting his um, um, his stories and his uh, narration in this um, work. All right, now a lot of the stories that still tells are fascinating, often horrifying. Um, and that's all in this uh, work. Okay, the conductor here is Kent Triddle, uh, Joshua Brew, Rahan Bryce Davis, Dashan Burton, Malcolm J. Merriweather, and Lakita Mitchell are the soloists. Then we have the Oratorio Society of New York Orchestra, Oratorio Society of New York Chorus. Okay. All right. Uh, the stories in the text are all pretty epic, and this is going to require some really serious... Um, compositional skills okay because uh the, the, it's a big story that he's setting and again i don't feel like the composer rises to the occasion okay the the music kind of lets the text down in my opinion okay performances are all accomplished They're, everybody's really good on this recording <coughs> excuse me but they didn't captivate me too much um again a kind of an unriveting work about a very riveting text i really kind of wanted the music to stop so that i could read the uh, I could read what what the text said, or, or maybe even go to the book and read what William Still wrote. Okay, 
yeah, the text is more interesting than the music here. William Still, by the way, is an interesting character. If you know anything about American classical music, um, there's a composer named William Grant Still, African-American composer. And he was in William Still's family. He was one of William Still's, like, later ancestors. So a pretty interesting family. Um, I would look up William Still. He's an interesting character. But uh, the focus here is Paul Moravec, who's the composer. And I didn't really like this work much, though I did like the subject. Okay. Last, Once Upon a Time, Matthew Gard, Conductor, Skylark Vocal Ensemble. And there are two um, uh, art, other artists on here. There is Benedict Sheehan, the composer, and Sarah Walker, who is a storyteller, and that's exactly what she does. She narrates on this recording the stories of Snow White and the Little Mermaid, so the Grimm Brothers and Hans Christian Andersen. Okay, by the way, Sarah Walker is, she's a, not the soprano, the British soprano Sarah Walker. This is a different person. Let's not confuse the two. Okay, this Sarah Walker is a storyteller. It's her profession. Okay, there. so she's really the uh, one of the stars in this program that weaves um, Benedict Sheehan's original music with scores by Vaughn Williams, Poulenc, Bernstein, and a few others. Okay. It's an excellent recording, a creative program. I liked all the choral works that I heard. I found the constant intrusion of the storytelling voice annoying. So basically what happened was uh, Sarah Walker would narrate the story of Snow White. The story would stop, and then you'd hear a choral work on that theme, and then she'd resume the story. And I, I just kind of was like, just, I didn't want to hear the narration. I just wanted to, um, you know, hear the, hear the choral works. It's a, it's a beautiful recording, though. Um, and if you like this sort of thing, I would recommend it, but I didn't. So anyway, my pick in this group is Kostowski, Requiem for Fallen Brothers. Okay, on to chamber music and small ensemble performance. Now, I only heard a few of these, so Russ, you're going to take over from here. Yes, so next is the best chamber music or small ensemble performance category. And the nominees are... Contemporary Voices by the Pacifica Quartet. This is also a Pulitzer Prize winning collection of three compositions. Then we have something that's uh, interesting. The Healing Modes by the Brooklyn Rider uh, Quartet. Hmm. Uh, then we have something. <laughs> I, I, I heard this. I didn't know what to make of it. This, is, really. uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I won't say interesting, but uh, Place by Ted Hearn. And the uh, recording called uh, Heinz Fields. Uh, also, <laughs> another interesting thing. I think selection. it's called Fields by Devante Heinz. I think he'd be the. Uh... Composer, yeah, no? well, the way they listed yeah. it is just Heinz Colin Fields. Yeah, Devante yeah. Heinz and Third Coast Percussion, mm -hmm. which I'll comment more on in a moment, and the <laughs> Schumann <laughs> Quartets by the Dover Quartet, the uh, very traditional uh, selection from this group. So, yeah, this uh, is the only, or that's the only like traditional um, performance yes. in this whole. Uh, Pacifica Quartet, the Contemporary Voices. Uh, so we've got three uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, selections uh, here. The first one is the uh, Shulamit Ron String Quartet number no. three, uh, which is described as depicting the experiences of the painter Felix Nussbaum, who died at Auschwitz in 1994. Mm. Uh, as uh, you would guess this is expectedly dark. Uh, it's mm. a very somber composition. Um, it's well performed, but uh, is very somber in uh, presentation. Uh, the next one is uh, Jennifer Higdon's Voices. Uh, this one is kind of interesting. The third, mu the third movement of this I, I found to be kind of uh, beautiful. Uh, the first mm. two, I was sort of just feeling it out. And then uh, the third uh, piece on here is Ellen Taft's Willix Quintet for Alto Saxophone and String Quartet, which is an interesting combination. Um, whenever we get some 
a saxophone in uh, classical music. And this is kind of fun. Yeah. It hints at some jazzy type of things, and it's quite playful, but it's sort of an odd combination of uh, pieces to put together on one recording. Uh, I guess they are all are so-called contemporary as the title, but I felt the continuity was uh, a bit strange uh, on this recording. I guess that's why they call the contemporary voices, because that's really the only thing these mm. composers have in common. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what I, these I, works have in common. They're all I contemporary. Listened, yeah. I listened attentively, but I wasn't particularly drawn in. Okay. Uh, then we have, uh, well, Healing Modes. This one is interesting in concept, but not, to me, somewhat lacking in execution. Yeah, I agree. So, I'll talk about the Beethoven on this in a minute. But So go what we've got is this... Uh, kind of a popular ensemble, the Brooklyn Rider, and they've taken uh, Beethoven's string quartet number 15, mm -hmm. but they've broken it up uh, over the course of the recording with contemporary compositions, which are based on a healing theme. So uh, one of the movements of the Beethoven is uh, sort of emphasizes the Lydian mode, um, which uh, for any musicians or performers is sort of the, the scale with a raised fourth uh, in it. And uh, the, it, the name for the mode comes from the, the, the Greek name for the scales. And the Greeks believe that this particular mode or scale based on this was a, a healing mode. There's something mm -hmm. uh, intrinsic about it that uh, was healing. And... Um, so the contemporary pieces that are sandwiched between the Beethoven uh, quartet movements are on this theme. Uh, I don't have them all written here, but th there are sort of like themes of medicine and things like that. But um, they are, the contemporary pieces are way out there compared yeah. to, to the Beethoven It was, it was kind of like taking medicine, really listening yeah. to them. Really. So um, the problem I had with this is, the concept is all, you know, fine and nice, and well, the performance is great, but there's no continuity to me in terms of, you know, the, the musical content here. So you sort of, you're, you're way out there uh, in these contemporary themes, and then you come back to one of the movements of the Beethoven. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, overall, I felt it's a quite uneven performance to me. I don't know. Yeah, I how felt you took it. that. I also felt that the Beethoven, the performance of the Beethoven string quartet, wasn't really very distinguished. It was pretty uh, prosaic. I mean, we, there's so many great recordings of these works of, of the string, the Beethoven string quartets in general, and I think they, I think they knew they weren't going to compete with those, so they sort of split it up and in, into this program. It's interesting. Um, it's interesting, but yeah, I know, I outstanding. No. They, Interesting. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, Next, I, I do I like. Say, go ahead. Yeah, I do like the Lydian scale, though. I often use it <laughs> when I play something. So uh, I like yeah. it too. That's the, the raised fourth, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, but that uh, that gets into the, uh, the what the uh, tritone, right? That's kind of a well, yeah. Well, well <laughs> it's a, it's different. Doesn't in seem usage, like it should yeah. be a. Well, one of my favorite on how you favorite trumpet players, uh, Blue Mitchell, often uses this mm -hmm. a lot in his improvisations, and so I, th I like that sound. But uh, I th anyway, here, yeah. I think yeah. Um, Sting uses it in the bass line, and every little thing she does is magic, too. Yeah, yeah. Because oh, it it's... goes up, and the, the fourth tone is like, it is the Lydian mode. It's kind of an odd sound. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, but it's, yeah. a, it's an uplifting sound. But here, I wasn't lifted very high. Um, yeah, every little yeah, thing she does bad. is magic, and you get that magic little note there. That's, That's right. Mm. Uh, the next nomination, uh, Ted Hearn. Yeah, uh, I want to ask, what is this doing here, and what is it anyway? Yeah, um, <laughs> to me, this is sort of there. There, there are nineteen songs or movements because this also shows up in the uh, best contemporary classical composition. Um, this uh, is not classical music by yeah, any it's, definition. It's pop music. It's pop music uh, in sort of maybe an artistic form. It contains a lot of uh, voice processing sort yeah. of on the vocals with other electronics. How this got into the classical category, I have no clue. 
Yeah, um, not only that, how did it get into the chamber category? I mean, it's a vocal yeah. work. It should be in the vocal category. Yeah, I'm just going to toss this out because to me, this is just a distraction. And I, I couldn't, evaluating on its own merits would have to be done outside of this category to me as a pop yeah. music or some sort of, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, th this is where I um, emptied the whiskey bottle, by the way, when, yeah. I, when I came up on this. So I had this, to go through the rest of it dry. This just so. goes out. This is not classical music. It may have some <laughs> merits on its own in a different category, but uh, I don't know. So somebody was not even having an adult beverage. They were on some other mind-altering substance to put this in here, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, uh, if, you want a if you want a political um, sort of, uh, you know, comparison, this is sort of like... I, I almost feel like this 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 um, recording's appearance here is like somebody being repaid for a political favor. I don't know. This doesn't yeah. seem right to me. Seems quite possible. Mm. Uh, now the next one nomination is uh, uh, Devante Hines and Third Coast Percussion Fields. Um, this I almost feel the same way about, um, just because uh, all. Percussion ensembles do not hold my attention uh, as a main attraction. And here we have uh, this Third Coast Percussion who have done some interesting things. There's, this is sort of their, uh, the thing they do is, is do sort of uh, interesting new types of uh, recordings of compositions. But uh, the, here we've got this percussion ensemble with uh, Heinz's um, Compositions. Apparently, his first uh, his first uh, foray into music was studying classical music, and he was uh, very influenced by Debussy. Um, so you can kind of pick that up. But uh, the overall impression I got was very new agey. Uh, mm -hmm. Listening to this, and uh, I started to get put into trances rather than be sort of transported through compositional. Uh, type of things, which often happens to me with percussion uh, re ensemble recordings anyway. And uh, so, yeah, it, it's kind of relaxing as background music, maybe, but um, as chamber music category, eh, uh, didn't you know, do there much is for a new me. Age yeah, there is a new age field in the Grammys. I'm kind of wondering why uh, this wasn't This should have been there. thrown in there. Yeah, yeah, that's how I felt anyway. Um, and the final nominee is the uh, Schumann Quartets by the Dover Quartet, which is an ensemble um, that has been getting a lot of uh, recognition uh, since around 2013. Uh, it was in uh, Banff International String Quartet Competition, where it won uh, all the three special prizes as the top uh, group. And uh, this is, uh, uh, when you listen to Schumann, I think probably... Uh, Schumann emulated uh, Beethoven and Brahms a lot, and uh, maybe uh, in in his uh, his quartets uh, doesn't quite sometimes, depending on the performance, rise to the same sort of uh, emotional uh, expression as his mentors did. But here, this is mm -hmm. uh, a very exciting performance. Uh, I, they somehow, you know, sometimes I, when I listen to Schumann, I feel like oh, he doesn't quite uh, reach the same sort of peaks of expression as in, as other, you know, perf other composers, composers in here. Right? But this mm -hmm. performance is really draws out the best parts of this composition, and I thought it was really exciting. Also, the recording is very excellent. So I thought this is a, a really nice recording of Schumann's. Uh, uh, quartets here. So uh, this one really caught my attention. Wow. Okay. I haven't heard that one. I'm going to have to check that yeah, out. Yeah, check it out. Um, I mean, right. you know, there, there are so many good, uh, we could go off and we, we, we would run out of time forever. There are so many good trios and quartet ensembles out there. And of course, this one has gotten a lot of attention and deservedly so because I think they're really good. But what they've done here with the Schumann to me is it, it made me listen more closely than any other Schumann recording I've heard recently. So um, mm -hmm. this one's really nice uh, for me. So um, yeah, here, I don't know. 
I, I've got to go basically with the uh, the Schumann, even though it's nothing new. It's just a really nice interpretation, and compared to the uh, the Pacifica, it was just dark to me. Uh, the contemporary voices, the healing modes was uneven. The Hearns and Hines was out there to me, and even though this is nothing new, as a new interpretation for these, uh, I enjoyed the Schumann most by Dover Quartet. So that's my pick of this uh, group. Okay, I'm going to make a prediction though, and I'm going to say that they're going to give it to the Pacifica Quartet because they like Jennifer Higdon a lot. I think they're going to give it to her. Oh. Well, not to her. It'd be okay. To the well, recording. whatever. I mean, yeah. That's my prediction. I'm not saying that this is my favorite one, but okay. Gotcha. Okay. All right, next one, best classical instrumental solo. We have a big recording that last year, Thomas Addis, Concerto for Piano and Orchestra. Kirill Gerstein is the um, pianist, Thomas Addis, the conductor, and he's conducting the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Number two, the complete piano sonatas of Beethoven. Guess who listened to that? Me, by Igor Levitt. Uh, pianist, uh, another pianist who's making a really big splash in the classical world. Number three, um, Bohemian Tales. This is a uh, set of works um, for violin and, I guess, orchestra here by Augustin Hadelich, the violinist, and Jakob Rusa. I hope I said that right. The conductor. Yeah, this um, one, um, yeah. it also has um, some, it, it also has a piano and violin uh only yeah. it has a sonata. Yeah, this is the only one in the group I didn't hear. Actually, oh, okay. I heard all the other okay. ones. I'll talk hey, about We're gonna have to one. tag team this one because sure. I know that the okay. The next one is Destination Rachmaninoff by Daniel Trifonov. Uh, yeah, this yeah, was great. This, one, this is a great. Yeah, yeah it's hard yeah, to not get, be hard to not be biased on this one. Yeah, yeah. Let Let's not. But there's other stuff oh, to talk about. Yes, here too. there is. And there's uh, the last one is uh, the American composer Christopher Theophanidis. Um, yes. Concerto for viola and chamber orchestra, and also a, there's a violin concerto. They're isolating the viola one, yeah. work here, but we actually listen to both. I think we like the violin concerto better, but I don't know. I liked mm. both really; they were both good. Yeah. Anyway, let's start with Thomas Addis. Now, I should mention before we start getting to our opinions that this classical music critics went nuts over this piece. They love Thomas Addis. They kind of see him as this current. Um, he's a British composer, by the way, um, and they see him as the uh, the modern sort of Mozart. You know, he's he is really brilliant. He seems to have this um, um, composing ability that's this amazing facility in everything he does. He he's he's really a, a brilliant person, a brilliant composer, um, and uh, people fell over themselves praising this work. Okay, and it's played by Kirill Gerstein, and I think yeah, this is a pretty great combination of soloist and work okay it's a it's a broad work um now we're we're, we're thinking about the solo performance here not the work itself so this is really Kirill Gerstein's award if it if he wins it right because this is um, um this is also nominated yeah. in best contemporary classical composition yeah um, that would be for Addis right yeah all right, so th this piece is really worth hearing. It's good. It's it's sort of um, it's got a lot of humor. Now, if you're kind of wondering what constitutes humor in an instrumental work, well, you'll have to listen. Uh, it's it's sort of subtle. Um, it's it's a it's a broad kind of work. Okay, um, it's it's very appealing. Um, there's, um, let's see, I heard at the end of the second movement, it kind of reaches an almost religious ending because there's a chorale, you know, sort of like just a bunch of chiming chords at the end. And then the third movement, again, starts with these descending scales at the beginning, um, you know, cadences that aren't completed, lurching rhythms. This is where the humor comes in. And it's all sort of comes across as light comedy. And it's very enjoyable for that reason. It's, it's not, it's got con serious it's got content. It's not just light, but it's just kind of a little wacky and enjoyable. It's it's a good piece. It's really clever. I thought. Well, I, I listened to this first because I started with the best contemporary classical composition category. Uh, okay. When we talked about how we would listen to this, we said let's start with that. So, yeah. uh, my notes include uh, when you, as you listen to this the. The contrasting moods and meters stand out. So there's a lot of you're going between 
different sort of uh, feelings and tempos. And then I, when I looked up the piece, I real I noted that it was written for the uh, pianist uh, here, uh, who is also a Gershwin specialist. Yes, uh, in terms of right. playing, so you can pick up sort of uh, hints at Gershwin's type of compositions, mm -hmm. um, and so there's a contrast between sort of dissonance and also beautiful sort of sonorities, and so mm -hmm. those are balanced out very well. Uh, and after you go on the journey of the first movement, when you get to the end, it sort of ends with a standard cadence, which is unexpected, yeah. and sets you up for what's coming next. However. Again, part of the humor I talked yeah, about. Yeah, for the humor, know. but mm. it's not that out there. It's quite accessible. No. So if you if you're a listener for sort of you know twentieth century music, contemporary music, uh, if you to me it's very evocative of Prokofiev and Bartok. Um, I hear a yeah, lot the of rhythm. It's it's heavily rhythmic, rhythmic, too, yeah. and yeah. sort of tonal, the tonal basis that those composers use is very sort of relatable here. Um, and then, in the, once you get to the second movement, is very dark and lush. Kind of, I found it very beautiful sounding. And then the third movement has a lot of very playful figures, and then it changes to be sort of dark and brooding. And uh, the final movement it ends with these huge kind of cascading piano yeah. figures. So uh, as far as a performance for the the soloist, uh, I thought th this for a contemporary piece, it's very technically challenging. Um, and it's, it's a big demand. And noting that it was written for this performer, particularly, I thought, it, you know, the, the, uh, the performance in the, in the piano technique was quite impressive. So, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed this one a lot. I liked it. All right. Next, Beethoven, Complete Piano Sonatas. Okay. Now, um, this is on Sony. It's not available as streaming, but I actually bought this box set last year when it came out. And I have heard, I didn't listen to it this week, of course. Uh, there's 32 piano sonatas. But I have heard the entire set over the course of time. All right. So, and it's a very distinguished set. Um, Levitt really likes to take on big projects in the past. He's recorded the Bach partitas, uh, the Diabelli variations, and the Goldberg variations by Bach, and the Diabelli variations by Beethoven. And, um, yeah, the, in the late Beethoven piano sonatas, which are included in this set. He didn't re-record those. They just included those mm. on this set. Um, now, the comparison I would make here would be with a, a recent set by jean Flamme Bavouzet, the French um, pianist, who I really like a lot, too. Um, Igor Levitt's approach is heavier. Now, Bavouzet is using um, a, a recent edition of the uh, piano sonatas. There, there was a a new edition of them that came out and um he goes for a sort of light sound i think he's trying to emulate the sound of the piano in beethoven's era which was more of a it was called the forte piano and it, it uh it had a much lighter more tinkly sound um which you can't really get on a regular piano but uh Bavuzzi went for a lighter touch levitt also has a he he's a little heavier than Bavuzzi, but he's also faster and i thought the Bavuzzi was really fast um, they, I'm wondering, cause I'm, I'm used to hearing these, these pieces played at a, a slower pace. Um, I feel like a lot of detail gets lost at the speed, but, um, the shape of the entire movement comes out very clearly. You know, you, you mm -hmm. kind of hear all the, the sections, oh, this is over and now this is starting and, and that sort of thing. And I guess that's what he's going for. Uh, this, this works especially well for the, the more unique, um, Sonatas like the last five, they're they're a little, you know, they can be hard to follow, especially if they're played at a at a soft pace, at a, I'm sorry, at a slow pace. Um, yeah, but I feel like he's he's going for form here over um, detail. Now all the detail is in there, but it passes by really fast. I was really kind of like surprised at how fast these performances were. They're excellent. They're very very distinguished. Um, a new, the new benchmark. I don't know about that. Um, I, I don't know what to say. I still like the, um, for me, the benchmark for these among modern pianists would be Richard Good. And that came out in about, I think the nineties. So it's pretty old now. Um, but he, he's, he sets a very 
you know, a good pace and gets a lot of detail out. Yes, thanks. Um, thanks to Sony, yeah. I haven't heard this particular recording, although I have hmm. heard other Levitt performances, which are impressive. Uh, yeah. As you say, the the reviews of the Bavose were just gushing this year, and oh. rightfully so. And his approach is very well, those light. Were for the the concertos that was for the concertos yeah concertos yeah, uh, yeah. but his touch as you say yeah. is is fleeting and light and it's very unique um so there's competition in this area for you know these well-known beethoven things um so i although i can't comp comment on these particular levitt ones uh, i'll tell you what we'll I, put I'd the like uh, jean flam bavouze beethoven piano sonatas in the uh the links so you can check that out we figure yeah. you can find the uh oh i've heard on, them yeah on your yeah. own yeah I've, I've heard no but them, yeah, for the yeah. for the listeners you know yeah yeah everyone should we want to recommend up. it yeah so yeah yeah the, i mean well with the re the last year there's lots of beethoven to listen to so um, oh yeah yeah but um yeah so it's, it's nice to have something in here like that yeah. uh then the next nomination is uh, bohemian tales uh augustine hudelik uh jacob Hrusa, conductor, uh, Charles Owen, what do we have here? Symphono Orchestra. Symphony Orchestra des Bayerischen Rundfunks. Yeah, whatever. Uh, pronunciation is tough on here. Anyway, we've got uh, Dvorak, Janacek, Suk pieces for violin. And we have um, orchestral pieces combined with, uh, I believe there's a sonata piece, and another piece is just uh, with... D uh, Dvorak piano and violin. Uh, it, this is a nice collection uh, of Bohemian region uh, composers. Um, everyone is probably familiar with these Dvorak pieces and perhaps the Janacek, um, but Suk is probably less well known, although I, I really like his orchestral things. Uh, and uh, to have these all here in sort of a smaller group in the chamber music category is really nice and uh, I found these to be very nice performances and the recording is spot on so uh, as sort of a bohemian theme recording I thought this was very classy and nice okay and next have you heard this we one arrive at which one I don't have the bohemian oh, tales I, heard I this one. yeah heard. it's very good however um, in comparison to Mr. Daniel Trifonov's destination Rachmaninoff uh, we have, uh, this is the arrival, and uh, there's also the uh, uh, departure. I guess that was previous, right? That was, that was, uh, that one came before. I guess this yeah. is where he arrives. So, um, yeah, here with the Philadelphia Orchestra, I have the uh, departure, arrival. There's also the Rachmaninoff Variations, and also the uh, Piano Trio albums, which also includes a trio arrangement of the um the yeah we should have mentioned these are all different albums yeah different albums about. there's a four yeah. albums which are available as a set only on vinyl do um, a search for daniel trifonov uh rachmaninoff yeah and uh, just there's go for a recording they're really thing. good and and yeah. the trio the trio album includes the uh second concerto uh movement uh for oh, for, for trio, trio. Mm -hmm. um so yeah that's a very uh nice uh, arrangement uh all these are great um the, as a set and what's great is yeah, what I, i'm a i really like uh, rachmaninoff and as some people will say oh rachmaninoff is you know uh it, it's too schmaltzy or emotional oh, but i don't agree especially with the no, performances here. when it's played by yeah. the right especially uh, Russian performer. The Russians do this exceptionally and well. So yeah. Trifonov's interpretation is stoic and not schmaltzy at all, and it's yeah. spot on and brings out everything that's right. And passionate well. too. He's got and a lot of. It's yeah. yeah it's exactly yeah. the right combination of of uh, technical, you know, su yep. supreme performance with not over emotional interpretation. So all of these recordings in this one here are just fabulous. So I can't say we, too we much should, about those. We should mention this recording, Arrival, Destination Rachmaninoff Arrival, has the mighty third piano concerto on it. So that's um, one. And the other one is the first. The first this yes. is the first and third. The first and third. Uh, yeah, people will remember. People who don't listen to classical music might remember the third from the movie Shine. That was the uh, work that the pianist in that movie was 
Oh, uh, right. Trying to play. Okay. And the other and, one uh, is the second and fourth, right? And then. Well, that's the, the yeah, that's um the, the departure. first edition of this departure yeah yeah but and the one the one that's up for the grammy this year is the, one yeah. the third and the fourth is the one that most people don't want to play because it has like those huge intervals which yeah rachmaninoff had those giant hands you need giant that, uh, rachmaninoff hands to play yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, but uh truth enough can play them all uh yeah so yeah that's great i wonder if he yeah. has giant hands i mean they, they have I don't techniques think so. to get around it you know i kind of i don't think so um, yeah. yeah, he doesn't look like a really big guy. No, no, but he's uh, yeah, he's fabulous. I hope he, yeah. I hope we he, he doesn't just like disappear as some sort of uh, millennial yeah, magnetic. Yeah, or the, something. yeah. In, in the detail, a lot of times in Rachmaninoff's piano concertos, the orchestra swells can cover up the quieter yeah. piano playing. Not the case here. You hear everything. No, and these it's are really great, fantastic. Yeah, these are great. I, I highly recommended. You know, I I could yeah. listen to all of these on streaming, but I had to buy them all. And, yeah, uh, I, I own all of these shelf. too. Yeah, they're so really this, fantastic. They're just great. But yeah. now this category, this is maybe the most interesting category category for me because we've I got one so more too. here, which I was everything in it. Yeah. the most uh, maybe unexpected find here. Uh, how do we yeah, say this, this was name? Great, here? Christopher Theophanidis. Yeah, Theophanidis. Okay, it's a Greek name. But Sounds he was Greek, born but he's in American. Dallas, Texas. Yeah, he was born Yeehaw! in Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. No, that's not what his music sounds like. It's right really... a Greek guy. No. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We're not doing this guy any favors. And he deserves favors because no. these are. He does because, and I, I yeah. want to talk about this one particularly because yeah. um, we have this recording, the Concerto for Viola and Chamber Orchestra. And um, what we have here uh, is a recording by the Albany Symphony. And uh, when I was a youngster and studying classical trumpet, I studied with uh, Hank Carr, the one of the trumpet players from the Albany Symphony. So this is near and dear to my heart. And uh, also, uh, the part of this album, although it's not clear uh, which uh, composition was recorded there, was recorded at the Troy Savings Bank Music Hall. Uh, I think back when I used to go there it was just called the uh, the the Troy Music Hall I guess maybe the bank has uh, supported them uh, in recent years but uh, it's it's one of the supposedly one of the best music halls in all of uh, North America and I remember uh, when I, I went there to see uh, various classical uh, performances but uh, I, I believe it dates from the early uh, 19th century and they had the original uh, seating there still. So you had these unupholstered chairs that were quite uncomfortable, but they were reluctant to change any of the decor because they didn't want to negatively influence the acoustics, which are wonderful in the hall. And uh, so we have this um, this recording and uh, we have, uh, what is it? It's a, a concerto. The first one is for violin and the second one's for viola. Yeah, and, we uh, listen to the whole recording, although the viola is, concerto is the one that's being highlighted in this category. Right, because I believe the, yeah. the violin one has been recorded before with a different yeah. performer. And this new recording has, uh, the the composition has been uh, edited based on the, the uh, performer uh, here's uh, sort of input into that. But I found this uh, uh, really uh, intriguing. Uh, this music is very accessible, but mm. also very expanding. Uh, his uh, use of um, melody incorporating sort of, uh, as you say, Eastern themes and yeah. uh, modes. Well, in the violin. Yeah, in the violin anyway. concerto uh, is fabulous. And uh, and the, the viola one is also interesting. Um, it, it's very accessible and you can follow the melodies well, but his use of the orchestra in the colors and orchestrations is always very interesting. Um, reading up on this, I guess he had some sort of um, initial interest in success in the 90s, and then it sort of faded. But now with this recording and others, he's sort of uh, coming back into prominence. And I believe it's a very well-deserved, I think, that uh, a lot of people could appreciate this music, but there's more depth to it other than just surface sort of appeal. Um, I, I found these very intriguing, and uh, the recording is uh, really, really nice. It's great for uh, you know a small city like uh, Albany 
to uh, churn out uh, such a great recording too. So yeah, this one is uh, really musty. I want to listen to this again and again Me too. because uh, it was very. Uh, very eye-opening. So, this whole category for me, or ear-opening, um, yeah, I, yeah, ear-opening. That's right, <laughs> adultifying. Uh, this ear, uh, Addis, ear cleansing, ear, ear wax cleansing. removing. So, this category is maybe the most difficult. I mean, the the Addis one is a very interesting composition for me. Um, I loved the Bohemian Tales recording because there's a lot of my favorite uh, uh, composers from that region. It's a nice. Uh, Nice performance and you know collection of recordings. The Rachmaninoff is I've been listening to for a while. It's great, yeah, I and love then this. Yeah. The, but this uh, Tiafanidis one is just sort of from out there, and it was it was great. So I can't I can't pick. I, I'd be happy if any one of these won, but um, they I, I really like them all. Yeah, I want to say to listeners, by the way, um, just to just stress this, that Theophanidis isn't an, a composer most people have heard of. I certainly didn't know him before I heard this recording, but this is a real find, and I want to encourage um, people to listen to it. You know, give it, a, you know, listen to it, give it a stream. It's it, these both works have ear catching ideas, oh, and yeah. it's just really appealing. It's just fantastic. I, I think yeah, he has this. He has a potential to attract more. You know, a greater audience to this sort of contemporary sort of composition, and not in, not in any sort of like simplifying or you know sort of aiming for accessibility way. It's just that good in his compositions that this music is very engaging, and uh, and the the performance is just incredible too. Um, yeah. So the the. He, I think you know what's lost and can be lost in uh, contemporary music, in you know aiming for some sort of uh, composing according to some sort of rubric or something, uh, or achieving you know some other goals in I don't know in expression expressionistic means or something is that there's not a melody there, and you know and then comparison in the same category because we have Rachmaninoff and some people say, ah, you know, ah, it's Rachmaninoff, you know, all these minor melodies, you know. Yep. Um, but yeah, anyone could be just who can write beautiful melodies like that? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you who can. This Theophanidis can write the melodies. The Theophanidis. He, <laughs> he, he can write melodies that are like that, you know. Yeah. And so to me, yeah, that that's kind of interesting that they're both these recordings are both in the cat, same category because these these are this this concerto for viola and violin they have really nice melodies here in something that's you know new and fresh so um you don't yeah. hear that a lot in you know real new uh music and uh so you know the, you should check this out yeah i'm going to check this okay. out again and again Okay, so your pick, Russ, who's going to win this group? Who should win, and who do you think is going to win? Who should win, who should win? I, I pick probably think for who should win. Aris will probably win um, because... Um, no, well, it'll be Ger Gerstein, right? Because it's the soloist. Uh, I think Gerstein, uh, will, Gerstein win will probably he's, win for this. Because he's the only um, American in the group. Really. Yeah. <laughs> that's um, and that's Except okay because it's, yeah. it's a, it is a good performance. Um, I is. guess there's nothing you... Of a contemporary com work. Completely you know. unique about the Bohemian Tales, as long as you just hear this album because it's a nice collection. Um, Trifonoff is going to go on to great... I mean, everything this guy is going to do is going to be gold, and he's very young from now on. But, he released um, an album of the Prokofiev seconds and the Stravinsky's. Yeah, he's going to. It's he's, just fantastic. He's, he's just so going to rip through all of the the Russian, the Russian things, and he's mm -hmm. going to be impossible to ignore because he's that good. Well, he and, already is. Uh, I think. Um, yeah, this is what I want people to hear because I think it's. Although I, you know, I really liked the um, Addis, but the Tiofanidis is 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 more unique and. Uh, that's who I'd like to. I'd like to hear uh, get recognition from this. And it's Albany Symphony. Come on, all right. Give them some recognition. Okay, next best classical solo vocal album. Looks right. like I'm on my I'm own. I'm going to hand this over to you because I haven't heard any of these. 
<laughs> All right. Well, we have number one, American composers at play. William Balcom, Ricky Ian Gordon, Laurie, La Laurie Laitman, sorry, John Musto, and Stephen Powell is the uh, um, soloist, I guess, here. Um, the ensembles playing are Ataka Quartet, William Balcom, Ricky Ian Gordon, Laurie Laitman, John Musto, Charles Nydick, and Jason View. That's what I have here. Okay, number two, Claire, Clairierie, Clairière, songs by Lily and Nadia Boulanger. Okay, that's performed by Nicholas Fahn, the vocalist. He's a, um, he's a tenor. And uh, Myra Huang, who is the um, pianist. Third, Farinelli with the magnificent Cecilia Bartoli on mezzo-soprano. And our good friends Giovanni Antonini and Il Giardino Armonico. Remember, they did the uh, the Haydn recording that we reviewed uh, two weeks back. All right, number four, A Lad's Love. These are all English songs from around uh, the World War I years. Uh, Brian Giebler is the um, uh, tenor here. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's a tenor. He's American, by the way. And Stephen McGee is the accompanist. He's playing the piano. And last one is Ethel Smythe, The Prison. Um, this is a symphony with vocals, actually. It's, um, you know, you can think about um, Mahler's Das Lied von der Erde, something like that. Sounds as terrible. As an example. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> uh, Sarah Brelli and Dashen Burton are the uh, soloists, the vocal soloists. And... Um, the Experiential Chorus and Experiential Orchestra perform it, and James Blackley, the conductor. Okay. Going back to the top, American Composers at Play. These are American art songs, and I really like American art songs. They're usually really charming, and they capture some small bit of American culture. I remember a song by, uh, I don't think this was on here. I didn't hear the whole thing. But uh, William Bolcom has a song called uh, Murray the Furrier. And it, it's about a, <laughs> just a family member who uh, is a furrier. He sells coats. And uh, he, he talks about him at work. Just these little kind of like slices of life. These Norman Rockwell in song sort of um, uh, things. I really enjoy them. It's, it's, I find them charming. And this is a charming set and well sung by Stephen Powell, um, who is a baritone. Okay, uh, the baritone voice really suits these songs really well because it just kind of feels like it has like authority, and you know you can you you know these things really happen. They're not just tall tales. Uh, well sung. He's in character too. He's an American singer, so he gets the idiom extremely well. This is a good one to add to the collection. Um, as far as winning the Grammys, though, I don't know. It could in this group, but we'll see. I liked it enough. I liked this. I I generally like collections like this. Because we don't hear enough of these songs, and they're really, really good. Okay, Clairière by um, Lily and Nadia Boulanger. Uh, people probably know, if you know your music history, Nadia Boulanger was a great teacher of the 20th century. And uh, she was a composition teacher, and uh, she um, advised and taught, I don't know if she taught, but she advised certainly Stravinsky, um, people like Elliot Carter and Aaron Copland. Um, Leonard Bernstein, and up to Philip Glass, who also went to Paris to study with her. And all of them became really famous. She, she was an amazing woman. Um, and she was an amazing teacher, too. I, I, have a, I saw a video of her teaching, and just her insight. She's one of these people who had incredible insight. Now, her sister Lily was really the, the greater composer and uh, would be one of the great composers of the 20th century uh, had she not died at age 24 of a form of tuberculosis. I and mean, she was already writing these beautiful songs. Okay. Uh, the appeal in this recording are, is the program, the songs by the Boulanger sisters. We don't hear th these enough. They're really good songs. Um, let me see what I've got here. All right. Uh, Nicholas Fahn, the uh, tenor on this, he's American, and he sings the songs with sensitivity. He's got this really nice, sensitive, high range, but he's he's lacking the, the idiom here. Uh, these are French songs, and they kind of require something a little lighter than he delivers, and a little more idiomatic, somebody who a little more familiar. I mean, he could speak French for all I know, but someone more familiar with the... F 
the way French is used, let's say, um, to know how to shape these um, phrases. Myra Huang, on the other hand, well, I don't want to knock Nicholas Fine. It's a very good performance, but I just would have liked something more idiomatic. Myra Huang, the pianist, though, is her playing is gorgeous. She's got this light gossamer touch in all of these um, accompaniments that... Um, the thing is, her playing is just fantastic, and f she makes Fon's voice sound kind of heavy on top because she's playing so lightly. I would kind of prefer like a lighter voice in these, and Huang in a, like a lighter voice would be really ideal, I think, in this recording. Okay, so I didn't think these were vocally idiomatic enough, though it's a nice performance, and it's great to hear these songs. I really enjoyed them. Fon is a good, sensitive um, interpreter, though. I'll give him that. Um, I want to hear more of these songs. Next, the magnificent Cecilia Bartoli in Farinelli. Now, Farinelli was um, the most famous castrato singer of all time. In order to become a castrato f singer, you may not know, you have to have your testicles removed at uh, right before you reach puberty. And you have this high voice forever. <laughs> know what that Too late means. for that. Thank you. <laughs> I missed my chance. <laughs> Thank God. Anyway, um, the, the thing, the thing about that is, um, when when you have that voice like locked into place after that operation, you are able to sing in the uh, I guess soprano range in the high like falsetto range, but with full vocal power from your diaphragm so you're not singing falsetto I'll you're stick singing to the your baritone, full voice I think. yeah that'll be yeah so you're here. singing kind of like a baritone except in a high range and mm. the sound was by all accounts mesmerizing women used to go crazy over they would these go guys. balls to the wall no yeah except that he couldn't satisfy they couldn't them say afterwards that, yeah. um, in fact there's a movie about Farinelli made in the 90s where Farinelli has a brother who satisfies all those women after Far Farinelli turns them on. Oh, I think it's a we're, good movie. We're Check deep, it out. It's deep enough into the adult music we can consider these We can these talk things. because we're adults yeah. here, right? Yes. Right? Although we are yeah. not explicit, we we can consider adult themes, yes. Okay, now, the, the rather disturbing album cover has a photo of Cecilia Bartoli uh, with a mustache and beard. Oh, I've okay. seen this. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and... Um, it's it's kind of, you know, it's it's odd. It's not really right. Now, the the idea is sexual ambiguity, and that is exactly well, what that's the theme. Have. That's the theme of the current. Uh, how do you say? Yeah. Zeitgeist. The zeitgeist. Yeah, zeitgeist, sexual ambiguity. Yes. Except that I don't know. This was far more. If I think Farinelli and people like that were far more se projected far more sexual ambiguity than anybody does today. Um, in, in my opinion, anyway. Okay, so um, so she's a mezzo-soprano, and she's singing the operas that Farinelli sang, that op you know, opera arias that were written for Farinelli in his day, and they're mostly by Nicola Porpora. He's, he's the main composer on the set, but other Baroque-era composers as well, and they're all gorgeous um, arias. Um, the whole idea, though, of sexual ambiguity does not come across... Okay, because Cecilia Bartoli is a mezzo soprano and she's singing these as a mezzo soprano. So on the recording, you, you don't really hear any of that. It's just a set of um, Baroque um, uh, arias sung by a great mezzo soprano and with great accompaniment by, accompaniment by Il Giardino Armonico and uh, Giovanni Antonini. Okay, so the, the, I, I feel like the cover and the whole sexual ambiguity thing is a bit misleading advertising. It's a pretty ordinary, straightforward recording, except that the singing is absolutely brilliant. Cecilia Bartoli is a great singer. Um, just, uh, just a flawless technique, um, full voice, really fantastic, and she's really well-loved in America, too, so I think this has a good chance of winning the Grammy. All right. Uh, by the way, I want to mention the it was the sexual ambiguity of the castrato voice that used to drive people crazy. Back in the day, they used to just run to hear these guys sing. Okay, um, yeah, they they liked Frankie Valley too. So, 
Yeah, now I want to mention, if you, maybe if you're a classical music listener, there's a kind of singer today called a countertenor, and they take on all of these um, castrato roles now. But they're singing in a falsetto voice, so that's not what a castrato would have sounded like. They would have had far more like uh, vocal power coming from their gut than uh, these the countertenors do. So the countertenors are singing from their um, their head, what they call a head voice. Okay, so it's it's not in there it's not in their torso all right so it's a different sound but it's a, it's a living anyway next number 4 a lad's love these are uh, world war 1 era songs by conduct composers like uh, Ivor Gurney Benjamin Britten Peter Warlock Roger Quilter John Ireland um and a few others i guess okay Brian Giebler is an american tenor and he it fits into this idiom very well, rather surprisingly, you know. Uh, you often hear, you'll hear, sometimes hear British um, um, singers sing American songs, and they do them quite well. And the reverse often doesn't happen, but I feel like um, Giebler gets this idiom. He he sings them like he's just this young, naive lad, you know, falling in love for the first time or whatever. And he, he sort of sounds like he has that kind of innocence to him when he sings these songs. Okay. Um... Yeah, he he kind of sounds like uh, a young Brit of the era. Okay, there are more accomplished singers who have performed these works. Um, I wonder if this about this had a choice for, as a, as a Grammy, but it's really well done. Recommended. Okay, I liked it. And the last one is Ethel Smythe, The Prison. Okay, this is another example like um, what I talked about above with the, where the um, the text is really interesting, but the uh, execution of the music really isn't so interesting. Okay, um, this is classified as a symphony, and the sung text is a conversation between a prisoner awaiting death and his soul. Okay, and it's got this sort of Neoplatonic philosophical theme to it. Okay, what's you know, becoming at peace with oneself and attaining um, the, um, you know, oneness with the divine, okay? Fantastic, right? Sounds great. But the music was kind of bland, and the melodies are all unmemorable. So the music just kind of lets the text down. The text is actually very interesting. It's another example of uh, me wanting to stop the music so I could just read the text. Okay, um... Uh, it doesn't come across as song, but rather themes, okay? I'm hearing themes more than songs, okay, here. It also sounds very British, okay? If um, you think about, like, Elgar, and the, they they had a sort of, like, sound to it, a British sound, and she sort of has that, too. I think it was this... I think when you have, like, there's a style of composing, and you study at school with a certain composer, and everybody winds up, you know, sounding like that, teacher i think that's sort of what happened here um people wound up kind of in this um sort of uh british idiom of the time um yeah this is a beautiful recording by the way it's on sacd um and uh but uh i didn't like the work okay so anyway my choice in this group to win chichilia bartoli she's just fantastic and uh it's 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 all these these great baroque arias it sounds great okay uh, i wouldn't be surprised if um uh, stephen powell won too from american po composers that play it'd be nice but bartley this is just like towering performances she's just fantastic so farinelli my choice for winner in this group let's move on all right you are um, go ahead the last category best Not yet <laughs> this oh really <laughs> Oh, we are well, there's one more after this. Yeah. Where are we next then? Maybe I'm. We're on best classical movies. compendium. Compendium. That's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We have one more after that. Uh, compendium. So I guess this is the uh, sort of collection of works from uh, a composer. Uh, in this category, we have the uh, Addis uh, conducts Addis, which we've talked about previously. Uh, in the other category for the piano works. Yeah, and, the, and the key thing about this... Oh, God, I'm sorry. You want to go through the list. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and then we have the... Uh, how do I pronounce this? Sarajo? Sa Sarajo. 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 Uh, circle maps. Uh, 
You know, uh, Graal Theatre, Circle Map and Neige, which means um, uh, snow. Yeah. And Vertois qui est si loin. These are all French titles. Yeah, I, She's uh, Finnish, by yeah, the way. And I was finished listening to this before it was over. Uh, then we have, I liked this one a lot. I'll, uh, go, I'll, yeah, I'll we'll, take we'll have I'll contrasting take this one. opinions on this one. I'll have something to say about this uh, one. Okay. Then we have the uh, Cerebrie. Yeah. Symphonic Bach Variations, Cerebrie. Laments and Hallelujahs, Flute Concerto. Um, I... I liked this one. Uh, we'll talk more about it. A composer who also conducts here from Uruguay. Uh, right. And uh, we have these uh, very prominent uh, soloists, uh, Alexander Kondorov and uh, Sharon Bazali mm -hmm. on flute. Yeah, uh, she's fantastic. We have uh, uh, from the Diary of Anne Frank, uh, Meditations on Uruque. By uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, our yes. favorite conductor of the conductor, Copeland, uh, but not my favorite symphony. favorite composer. After listening yeah, to these, I agree. And I then agree. finally, uh, one more step down, uh, fire <laughs> and flood from uh, the contemporary choral composer Luna Pearl Wolf. Wolf. Yeah. Wolf. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Uh, we've already talked about the Odyss. Um Well. But it's a compendium award, so yeah. it's the piano concerto and the vocal work Totentanz, which is on the same yes. album. Now that's a vocal work. It's um, it's kind of I liked it actually. It's kind of it's a little disturbing. It's a 13th yeah. century poem, and um, it goes through all the um classes of society from the top kings and popes all the way down to like uh, I forget who the last one was, but it was like street cleaners or people like that. Yeah. And um, so it kind of has this goes down this hierarchy. And uh, each person kind of talks about their life, and then death responds, oh, this is the way I will kill you. So they're all kind of leveled to the same level at the end, and that's sort of like that whole medieval idea that, you know, people are all these different levels of society, but in death, we're all the same. Um, so it's a disturbing work, but it's a it's actually quite appealing. It's dark, but... Yes, bring on the coronavirus. It's, it's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be, yeah, it's it's good to be uh, listening to, I guess, this year, if you have a, a you know a strong uh, heart, let's say. Okay. Yeah. It's disturbing right. but highly listenable. It's, I would it's say. okay. Um, you like this uh, next one, the Seaho. Um, yeah. This one I yeah, found this... ingratiating. Um, oh, I couldn't find anything so. to hold on to here. It just. This is just noise to me. Um, oh, I didn't there's, there's some so. colors, colors of well, that's, sounds. Yeah. That's about the only thing I could find here. But um, well, that's what's that's what you're supposed to be really oh, okay. kind of going for here. But it wasn't uh, enough. Kaya Sadiaho, so. she's a Finnish composer, um, and these are all works from the last 25 years of her career. And uh, to follow these works again, this is another example of someone who's. Um, um, I think using the landscape of Finland that she's familiar with and sort of trying to express it in music. And she does that by in timbral combinations. So the sound of the combined instruments um, and there, there are no melodies or anything like that. It's just the sound and they're long drawn out sort of sounds. And uh, some of them are really beautiful. A lot of them are dark and disturbing. Uh, the entire, um, effect is atmospheric really um i guess you could say it's oh it's too you know lightweight or too off-putting but i was kind of mesmerized by it i liked it a lot um the song the piece um circle map is um oh, i got a big plosive there okay uh is um heavy in the wind instrument she uses a lot of winds and this has a recited text and a low male voice which is very mysterious these are all poems by Rumi in the original Persian. Um, and nuage de neige means clouds of snow. This is for all cellos, and she's really using that dark kind of cello timbre to put this piece across. Um, okay, this, this is a very haunting dark piece. It's, I think it's supposed to evoke winter in Finland, where, of course, it's going to be dark most of the day because they're so far north. Um, and the last piece was Graal Theatre. This one was a big combination of orchestral um, instruments. I like this a, a lot, I thought. It doesn't move, really. This is uh, fairly static music. It, and if it moves at all, it moves slowly because it's not terribly um, tonal. But I, I, I don't know if it, enjoyable isn't the right word for it. It's a little heavy. and But it was, it was pretty fascinating. I liked it. 
I needed to okay. get myself out of this with an ice pick and a thermal <laughs> okay. blanket or something. Yeah. Um, oh, well. Yeah. The, not for me. Don't leave uh, me alone. Oh, man. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't hack my way out of this one. Um, okay. However, uh, I did enjoy the uh, Cerebrier, um mm. who also conducted this uh, piece. I, apparently, his... From what I've read, he, he hasn't gotten a lot of recognition for his own compositions, but um, I really enjoyed uh, this performance. Um, he has these uh, top soloists. Yeah, here, Alexander uh, Cantaro on the piano and Sharon yeah. Bazali on the flute. Um, Fantastic. I, I found that um, he, he he writes, this music is accessible. The, the uh, linear melodies and lines of the composition are very nice. Uh, of course, the Kantarov is doing lots of interesting things on the piano, but on the flute piece, uh, I liked the melodies. Uh, they they took in took me in interesting directions, and uh, I, I found them to be you know really coherent and enjoyable compositions. So I, I think his I I hadn't encountered his uh, compositions before, but um, I think they're worthy of consideration. Uh, a lot and uh yeah the the whole production is quite good so i liked this album a lot yeah i and, liked it too yeah yeah that was uh, one of the enjoyable ones the next one um <laughs> the, then there uh, were the next two <laughs> yeah the uh from the diary of anne frank and meditations on Duke, who uh well the uh anne frank one this this is uh uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, uh, his own original compositions. Um, and well, I don't know what to say about this. Uh, I really. want to mention again to an American conductor again or composer taking on European themes. All right. It's, yeah. I always think that's kind of a bad match. The, yeah. It, it was bad for me. Um, mm. the, uh, the Anne Frank thing is, uh, recitations. Yeah. From I guess her diary, uh, set to music, which uh, I I really as as we stated in the last episode, uh, I really dislike recitations. I I don't have a uh, an ear for this type of thing uh, over music. Uh, if it's not vocal, uh, setting music to recitations doesn't interest me, and so this I found tedious. Um, then uh, the the next one is the Ryuke, which is uh, uh, I guess uh, Rainer Maria Milke. He's a Bohemian Austrian poet, uh, and this makes a vocal work out of that. Uh, and uh, to me, it didn't didn't do anything uh, for me. So I, I'm wondering why an American composer is he is he aiming for these European themes? for some sort of extra credit or something. Um, I don't know. I mean, considering in this awards category, we've had, you know, the Copeland and the Ives who focused on American themes. Now we have an American who's aiming for sort of European themes. Uh, I, I didn't find anything to grasp onto or in the content. And then in the performance itself, I didn't, find anything that attracted me to it. So these were sort of flat line for me in this whole album. Yeah, I actually didn't hear this one, so I can't comment oh. anyway. I did, unfortunately, hear a bit of the next one. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that one. Yeah, okay. Then we have the uh, Fire and Flood, uh, the Luna Pearl Wolf, uh, which was yeah. initially not interesting to me because it's a choral recording and I'm not very interested in choral works. Yeah. But, um, yeah, listening to the... I, I, at least listen to the beginning of it and then checked myself through the the rest of it listening to it um yeah i i, I don't know it's I don't spoken and sung voice it was kind of fragmented sounding I, exactly. I didn't really like it much i do like matt hamovitz though the cellist he's uh the soloist on this yeah i, um, I don't actually think i heard that uh very mm. much uh, i i i, I checked here and there and listening to the vocal things and then it's not my, my not my to my liking 
this kind of uh, choral recordings anyway. So, okay. um, yeah, and then so it's on sort of themes that um, not really of interest to me. So, um, yeah, I can't really comment okay. much. So, this uh, is, uh, who do you think is going to win this group? Yeah. Who's going to win? Well, I think Addis is going to win one category. I think Addis is going to anyway. win too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, In this group, Cerebre would be a nice surprise to see. I would like to see about Cerebre. I'm especially re, you know, because I didn't know his music, so researching it a bit, it seems like he hasn't gotten a lot of recognition. And yeah. uh, if he's right there now conducting his own works and doing this, and uh, especially the flute, the flute the concerto, I thought was really nice. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to see him get some recognition for that. So it would be um, nice. Yeah, Tilson Thomas. Yeah. No. Uh, no. Yeah. So I think the Sorahel will, will win, but. Yeah, if, someone uh, once mentioned to me that when it comes to uh, classical music, um, when you, you're setting tragedy, Europeans are exceptionally good at this, and except, especially Russians, and they're not Europeans, but uh, they, they do tragedy in music really, really well, and Americans really don't. No. And you would think, and it's a funny thing, if you compare, like, say, you know, any work written about, say, in America about the Holocaust or something like that, not in America, but by an American composer, to say, like, a string quartet by Shostakovich or something like that, I mean, the difference is, like, you know... Um, you know, twilight and deepest night, you know, it's kind of... Um, it comes off as virtue signaling, kind of, yeah. Yeah, like, Americans don't really get tragedy. It's a funny thing, yet there, there's Not been yet. enough tragedy in America to... We may to, come uh, to... We may come to get it. Uh, you know, I think the entire culture has to suffer for that to happen, and yeah, that has happened become, in European countries. It may be countries. coming on soon, yes. Yeah. Well... Let's not, let's not speculate on that. Oh, All right, God. last group. Finally, here we are at the finish line, oh, limping God. across. Limping, yes. <laughs> I'm How tired. long have we been doing this for? This looks like it's over two hours. Yeah, I really can't wait to get back mm -hmm. to choosing our own music. Um, yeah, which we will do. We'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, let's go on here. Best mm -hmm. Contemporary Classical Composition. Okay. First, uh, we've, Addis. We've discussed Addis at length already. Concerto for Piano and Orchestra. Right. Um, okay. Then we've had. Uh, we've also discussed the Daniel Poor. Daniel Poor. Yeah. Yeah, which I found tedious and not interesting. Yeah. Uh, so. Then we have. We also uh, discussed Carlisle Floyd, Prince of Players, which I thought was musically uninteresting. Might have been a good theater piece if you saw it live or in a video. Yeah. And then uh, we have uh, this Hearn piece again. Yes. <laughs> which we, uh, which didn't we already like discussed. All. And uh, yeah. it's uh, and then we have the mighty Christopher Rouse Symphony Number no. Five. Yeah, yeah. So this one um, uh, we talked about back when it was first released, and uh, we shared it uh, together. Uh, so it's a symphony in uh, one movement. Yeah, um, all four movements are all like kind of attached in this yeah, one yeah, it's continuing one, piece. You can one make sort them of out. Track, so. I guess you could say yeah. in contemporary nomenclature. Uh, yeah, as as with all Rouse uh, compositions, uh, you get a lot of nice brass and percussion in here, which is a lot of fun. And you get so, rhythmically propulsive yeah. rhythms, which is fantastic. It's, it's kind of fantastic. Exciting. And this is based on, uh, so he takes uh, inspiration from Beethoven's own fifth uh, symphony. Yeah. And, and so the fun part of uh, uh, listening to this is that uh, you get to identify um, where he incorporates elements from Beethoven's fifth, uh, which are sort of interspersed in here. Um, mm. And uh, since it's all in one track, um, like right right in here, I, I made some listening notes, about seven minutes and 49 seconds, the, the music really suddenly stops, and then like the slow moon movement begins. Yeah. Uh, and you get... Uh, uh, scherzo section coming later, about 17 and a half minutes. And then um, the, you get the final section uh, with lots of power and speed. And it ends about five minutes before the end. You have this huge bombastic timpani sort of yes. coming in. Uh, really? You know, because the Rouse, uh, you know, 
percussionist comes out in that. And so, yeah, but because Rouse yeah, is composing it. <laughs> yeah. And, and so yeah, I, I like this. Um, I, I found, and I've listened to most of his compositions, but um, this one uh, with the tie to Beethoven and, and those little sort of like Easter eggs in there, you can um, pick out uh, with that. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's maybe one of his more, more most accessible uh, pieces and uh yeah we you know he's not we lost him recently uh, in 2019 he yeah, died he went, yeah he this will probably down. be his last ever appearance in this uh category yeah. because it's for and, contemporary but, uh, composition it's a, it's a very fun it's a very mm. fun uh piece and uh maybe uh, of all i think you know even people who might not listen to a lot of contemporary pieces would find this one uh sort of listenable and fun yeah, so i'd recommend Rouse. you check it out Christopher Rouse, yeah, is he's my he is he was my favorite uh, living American. He's probably my favorite American composer, really. Um, I I like his music a lot, and I'm kind of hoping they give the Grammy to this. He, like I said, he recently passed away in 2019, uh, so we won't be hearing any more Christopher Rouse. I'm really sad about that. And he, well, we'll be hearing there are a lot of unrecorded works by him that I'd really love to hear. Um, but we won't be getting any new compositions of him. So I'm kind of hoping yeah. he'll win this group. In this and, category, uh, I hope he gets it because mo uh, several of these are in other categories. And um, to me, in, he, in this category, yeah, it's really the outstanding one here. So go on, I Russ. Thought so. I thought it was the more distinguished work than the Addis because the Addis is a little lighter. But I wouldn't be surprised if they give this to Addis too. I'm going to pick Rouse though. I want Rouse to yeah, win. Yeah, I want Rouse to win this one, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there it is. Good. Oh, done. I'll tell you what. I need a drink. I might yeah. have to go out for one. <laughs> we we made it through this, and uh, that was quite a chore. Yeah. Um, but um, a lot know, of this music was very average, but there were one or two discoveries yeah. in here, and there are just other a few other recordings that we knew were really great already. Cause we both in the jazz and the uh, – well, actually, I found more in the classical that uh, I wouldn't have discovered otherwise, maybe yeah. because I have a wider radar net into the jazz category but um I, I just want to hear say i spent the entirety of 2020 because we were at home all the yes. time so i spent the entire almost the entire year with headphones on listening to music and i thought i heard all of the class the great classical recordings that came out last year and i guess i did um but i i had heard less than 25 percent of the recordings on this um on mm. this list, you know, so yeah. it was all new. It was really hard to do in a week. I didn't really get a good um, take on all of them. Some of them I didn't really need to get a good take on. I knew I wasn't yeah. going to like them. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, but, and this is, uh, I, I think it, this gives us something to springboard off from, but um, I think I'm looking forward to uh, going back to the format that we envisioned to... Uh, sort of focus the podcast on, which would be uh, recordings that we want to highlight uh, that may not be recognized by more mainstream uh, organizations. And so yeah, we want uh, to turn you on to some good yeah. music that we like anyway. So um, I think in our next episode, the plan will be uh, we'll uh, take a look at who wins these categories with uh, right. passing significance because uh, we've already highlighted those that we think are uh, worthy of recognition and restart for the remainder of the following uh, podcast yeah, for this year. A few of our own. And things that we'd uh, like to pick. I know I have uh, some that I I'm have really two already. excited yeah. about to uh, get going in jazz and classical and um, yeah just uh, sort of uh, leave yeah. these Grammys in the dust as it were yeah. because uh, yeah I was because uh, these are these are not the best classical recordings of the year let's just put no, it that no, way certainly okay. not the most interesting jazz ones either um, yeah yeah um, although uh, there were a few on here that are very good like yeah, the Addis okay. was a good example They're okay but I you know okay I'm um, I, I'm more interested in, in spotlighting things that sort of go under the radar. And now with the, the streaming being the main sort of uh, media format that people are uh, listening to, there's there's so many good things that sort of 
can go under the radar that people won't notice. And right. uh, I'd like to point out the ones that I catch at least and uh, get some artists some more recognition uh, where they deserve well, it. Yeah, In my case, I listen to so much classical music that, uh, you know, classical music, you know, new releases can be overwhelming. And I could just highlight ones that I especially liked and sort of recommend them to people who may want to get into classical music and know what's going on. Yeah. And for me, field, with so, jazz, you know. it's, it's sort of, there's always the mainstream and the critics' darlings of players. Mm -hmm. And and oftentimes those really correspond with uh, innovators or someone who's doing something unique. But what a sort of, sort of secondary interest to me through the... Uh, jazz history is uh, focusing on unique players who may not have been innovators, but yet had a unique voice so that uh, historically looking back and listening to what they recorded, you, you couldn't say, oh, you know, this was something new that they created, but what, yet they're unique enough that whenever you hear them, that whenever I hear them, you know, in any context, even if I'm out, you know, sometimes as we are in Japan, we often encounter a jazz in a background setting at restaurants or something. And when I hear that, it's like instantly I know this player, uh, whether I have that particular recording in my collection or not, just by the the selection of the scales they use. So for example, like today we were talking about Lydian mode. Ah, this right. is Blue Mitchell because he's going to use a Lydian mode on this type of thing. And, you know, although like, and as a case in point, Blue Mitchell He's not regarded as an innovator, but he has such a distinctive voice on the trumpet that he's instantly recognizable. And, right. you know, the, even more so today, where jazz is sort of really, uh, in in terms of compared to the other genres, the, the percentage of the market and listening is very uh, low. Uh, there's so many great players out there that aren't getting recognized. And so I'd like to bring some more attention to some great releases to share with other people. So uh, that's what I hope we can focus on going forward after this uh, focus on the critical Grammy attention to over. releases. Yes. Yeah. So the Grammys are on March 14th. We're in Japan. So that's going to be Monday morning, March 15th for us. Monday morning. Oh. So we're going to, our next podcast will be up uh, maybe a day later than usual, but we'll go through the uh, Grammy winners in jazz and uh, classical, maybe look at one or two other category winners too. And then we'll go on to our, uh, a few of recordings we've been listening to through all of this that we want to pass on to you. So that's until right. next time. Yes, well, hopefully we'll have some new recommendations. I've been stocking up. Well, I've got, I've got a lot. <laughs> paying uh, credence to these critical recordings, but uh, stocking up on my own recommendations to go forward. Yeah, and that's I've already got a few for, we'll enough go for a few episodes. To, so right. Yeah. So. There's, there's some jazz coming out, too, that I want to hear, like more yeah. mainstream kind of artists. But There are some good things coming up. So, anyone who stayed with us to the end of this Grammy review, thank you for listening. And yeah, I'm surprised we actually went through this. It took so long to get through all this. It took so long to we get a through lot to this. Say. It was a commitment, but as all commitments, we got something out of it, and we'll give something back. So... Looking forward to episode five with some new recordings and a concise review of the winners. Please stay tuned and tune in again to adult music to make sure you get an infusion of music for the mature mind.